Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. And I'm proud to be joined by my colleague, Ben Kalos. Uh, we are holding a hearing on the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. Uh, but before we proceed to the testimony of DOI, I'm going to make an opening statement regarding the independence of DOI. The mission of oversight and investigations has taken on greater import in a political age that has seen an unprecedented assault on the independence of the very investigative institutions that have kept government accountable and transparent. The role of the Oversight and Investigations Committee is not only to investigate and oversee city government, but also defend the integrity and independence of those who do. Even though the administration of President Donald Trump is without equal in the contempt it has shown for good government law enforcement and investigative journalism, here in New York City we have seen a less sensational but nevertheless insidious assault on the independence of New York City's oldest law enforcement agency, the Department of Investigations, as well as an assault on local investigative journalism. I have been troubled by both public and private attempts at discrediting the DOI commissioner, as well as investigative journalists who have drawn the ire and therefore the political disfavor of City Hall. Expressing disdain for good government law enforcement and investigative journalism, as the president has done nationally and as the mayor has done locally, represents a profound disservice to the public interest. The leading casualty of the quiet assault on DOI's independence has been the office of the NYCHA Inspector General. City Hall refuses to fairly and fully fund the office of the NYCHA IG, even though the IG has been instrumental in protecting NYCHA from millions of dollars in fraud. DOI investigators in NYCHA are woefully underpaid compared to investigators in comparable institutions whose operations are no more complex than and in some cases less complex than those of the Housing Authority. As shown in the chart before you, the disparities are egregious enough to speak for themselves. An entry level and DOI investigator on average earns somewhere between $55,000 and $57,000 annually. By contrast, an entry level investigator in NYCHA earns only $42,000 annually. An experienced DOI investigator, on average, earns $85,000 annually. By contrast, an experienced DOI investigator in NYCHA earns only $72,000. It is hardly a coincidence that City Hall's insistence on underfunding the office of the NYCHA IG comes amid DOI's investigations into the multiple management failures at the New York City Housing Authority. The threat to investigative independence is measured not only in dollars, but also in words. As President Barack Obama once said, words matter. In public appearances, the mayor has been dismissive, even disdainful, in the words he has spoken about DOI and investigative journalism. In January of 2008, during an interview on Fox 5's Good Day New York, the mayor attacked Greg Smith, an accomplished investigative journalist, as, quote, one reporter who has an ax to grind. In that very same interview, when asked about the false testimony of his NYCHA chairperson, the mayor spoke dismissively of DOI, even though DOI's core findings on the chairperson's testimony have never been credibly challenged by anyone at City Hall. In March of 2018, when the Daily News reported that the new DOE chancellor was named in a lawsuit for, quote, engaging in inappropriate flirtatious conduct with a female employee, the mayor, in an interview with Brian Lair, accused the Daily News of, quote, having an ax to grind. Fortunately for the public, the independence of the media is guaranteed by the First Amendment. But what guarantees the independence of DOI? A few months ago, the New York Post had an article on the independence of DOI with a sensational headline, de Blasio wants to ax investigation chief for, espousing, for exposing foul-ups. Leave aside for a moment the sensationalism. The article itself exposes a loophole in the structure of city government, one too glaring to overlook. There are no clear checks and balances that would prevent a mayor from unilaterally removing a DOI commissioner. 
the charter contains no structural protection for the independence of DOI from political retaliations. Investigations to be effective have to be undertaken without fear or favor. The fear of political reprisal, apart from the act itself, can be debilitating to the morale of an investigative agency. The only way to remove the fear of retaliation is to remove the ability to retaliate. The new Charter Revision Commission, set to, set to be convened by the City Council through local law, should reaffirm and reinforce the independence of DOI. The Charter should be amended to prevent the Mayor from removing the DOI Commissioner without the approval of the City Council. A role for the City Council in both the appointment and the removal of a DOI Commissioner would represent the strongest structural safeguard against political retribution. Just as important as the process of appointment and removal is budgeting. DOI depends for funding on the very mayoral administration it oversees. The financial dependency DOI has on the mayor is a threat to the independence it needs from the mayor. The charter should therefore be amended to empower DOI with an independent budget. The operational needs of DOI, especially the need for improved recruitment and retention of investigators at the office of the NYCHA IG, should no longer be at the mercy of City Hall officials who, to borrow a phrase from the mayor, might have an ax to grind. The charter revision should adopt what I would call the Robert Mueller rule. The investigators should be independent of the investigated and should be insulated from the politics of retribution. Uh, Commissioner Peters and his dedicated squads of investigators have been unfailingly vigilant in preserving the integrity of public life. Those of us on the Oversight and Investigations Committee must in turn be equally vigilant in guarding the guardians of good government. That will be our charge over the next four years. With that said, Mr. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Chair Torres and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. Actually, Commissioner, I'm, I'm going to swear you in. Can you oh, raise your right hand? Sure. Do you swear to tell the truth and hold the tru whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before today's committee and in your response to council members' questions? I do. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Chair Torres and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, I'm Mark Peters, Commissioner of the Department of Investigation. I'm joined by Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Investigations, Susan Lambiazzi, and Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Operations, Ganesh Ramerton. I want to thank you both for your words of support for the independence of DOI, which is a central requirement for our work, and also for the opportunity to address the committee today concerning DOI's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. I also welcome this opportunity to update the committee on DOI's recent work and our vision for the coming budget year. DOI's preliminary expense budget for fiscal year 2019 is $41.2 million, consisting of $30.8 million that supports approximately 395 full-time staff positions and $10.4 million for other than personnel services, such as supplies, equipment, and space. Included in the $30.8 million for personnel services is $4.7 million intra-city funding, such as the funding for Memoranda of Understanding with 13 city agencies that support 76 of the approximately 395 positions. In addition to the staff comprised in the agency's budget, there are an additional 306 headcount staff members who work for us through various arrangements with other city agencies, including staff working for the Inspector General for the Department of Education, also known as the Special Commissioner for Investigation for Schools, the Inspector General for the New York City Housing Authority, and others. This brings the total staff headcount who report through DOI's chain of command to slightly more than 700. In 2017, DOI investigations exposed and stopped the theft of public funds, strengthened fairness and integrity in city operations, arrested city employees for exploiting their insider access, and protected the safety of all New Yorkers. Additionally, our oversight work goes beyond city agencies and includes nonprofits, 
who are the beneficiaries of city contracts and employees of private companies doing business with the city. Specifically, in 2017, DOI investigations led to arrests and issuance of policy and procedure recommendations including the following. The arrests of five individuals for defrauding disaster relief associated with Build It Back program and an associated report documenting the findings of an interim investigation examining contractor invoices and field audits that so far have saved approximately $40 million of taxpayer funds. Also, DOI uncovered a $3 million fraud scheme in partnership with the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District involving the submission of reimbursement claims for school meals that were never served. Also, DOI exposed an illegal gas meter installation scheme that led to the arrests of National Grid employees and others on charges of enterprise corruption for engaging in dangerous practices similar to those in the 2015 Lower East Side gas explosion that killed two people. Further, DOI arrested one dozen city Department of Correction staff and saw multiple jail sentencings of others, all the result of ongoing investigations into contraband smuggling and inmate assault by DOC staff. Further, in partnership with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, DOI's investigation into the death of a worker at a construction site resulted in the indictment of a construction company owner on manslaughter and other charges. Additionally, DOI conducted multiple investigations into safety issues at NYCHA, including a report that exposed NYCHA's failure to conduct mandatory lead paint safety inspections and NYCHA's related falsification of documents submitted to federal regulators. Other NYCHA investigations revealed in excess of $8 million in contractor and tenant fraud. And finally, DOI worked with multiple agencies on the arrest of 13 individuals, including medical professionals, who trafficked opiates through their pain management clinics and a former state legislator who owned a medical testing laboratory affiliated with those clinics for a large-scale insurance fraud scheme that resulted in payments of over $13 million for Metro Plus, New York City's Health and Hospitals Corporation's insurance company. In addition, DOI issued 16 reports in 2017 and issued 969 policy and procedure reform recommendations, a 42% increase from 2016. Our reports, for example, shined a light on needed operational improvements within the New York City Police Department, including the way in which officers handle situations involving people in mental health crisis, training for interactions with members of the LGBT community, and the need to better assist undocumented immigrants who are the victims of serious crimes and who have been helpful with NYPD investigations with obtaining federal immigration relief. Other reports detailed the misuse of city resources, such as city-owned cars by high-level managers at DOC, including that agency's then commissioner. We also presented our findings in prevailing wage investigations that included the recovery and reimbursement of wages to workers on school construction sites of more than $1.2 million. Ultimately, our reports hold agencies accountable by giving the public a greater understanding of city operations and empowering city leadership, including this council, with facts and actionable recommendations necessary for lasting reforms. In terms of numbers and metrics overall, I can report that in calendar year 2017, DOI had 726 arrests stemming from approximately 2,700 investigations and over 883 referrals for criminal prosecution. In addition, I'd like to specifically address the needs of the Background Investigation Unit. The Background Investigation Unit is responsible for conducting mayoral investigations of mayoral and non-mayoral employees, 
working in decision-making or sensitive city positions. Our work helps determine whether candidates are suited to serve the public trust. <coughs> in 2017, the unit closed 2,782 background investigations. This represents over 185 cases per investigator at current, current staffing levels. Over 21% of background investigations closed in 2017 had potentially adverse information that may have impacted hiring or retention. Due to the ever-increasing number of background requests received and the static staffing levels, the unit ended the year with a backlog of 6,050 background investigations. To maintain the accuracy, thoroughness, and fairness which characterize DOI background investigations, the only way to reduce this backlog is to increase staffing in the unit. DOI has asked for funding for new lines in this area for the past several budget cycles. I'd like to emphasize that our background unit provides a direct essential service to the entire city. Furthermore, the vulnerability to the city inherent in not completing background investigations in a timely manner is acute. As always, DOI's goal is to leverage our expertise across the agency's 11 investigative squads to develop highly complex cases in line with our strategy of attacking corruption comprehensively through systemic investigations that lead to high impact arrests, preventive internal controls, and operational reforms. With that in mind, I note that we have recently made changes to our organizational structure with a view toward both consistency of investigations and maximizing DOI's ability to see across agencies to city functions as a whole. Previously, certain investigative squads, including those overseeing the NYPD and the Department of Education, operated separately from DOI's main organizational structure. Four years of experience has demonstrated to me that this does not allow DOI to maximize the impact of this work or to take full advantage of DOI's institutional knowledge and strengths. As such, we've taken steps to fully integrate this work within our reporting structure, a change that will result in even greater impact and ability to tackle issues going forward. Under this structure, we now have a full complement of inspectors general overseeing all city agencies, including inspectors general overseeing DOC, the NYPD, the Department of Education, the School Construction Authority, NYCHA, and NYC Health and Hospitals. All 11 of our oversight units, each led by one or more inspectors general, will work with their respective unit and across units to maximize the effectiveness of our operations. Finally, in addition to arrests and issuance of reports, we plan to turn additional focus to monitoring agency adoption of previous recommendations long after our initial investigations have come to a close. Such follow-up is essential and part of the virtue of having a permanent and independent IG function within New York City. Through our public reports, we empower the general public and governing bodies such as this council and city hall by enhancing agency transparency and prompting reforms that strengthen public policy. And our high impact arrests and emphasis on complex investigations means that we can shut down the most costly and damaging fraud schemes by attacking corruption vulnerabilities at their roots. Through this strategy, we continue to see success in enforcement areas across the board. I thank the committee and the city council for its support in our independent role and I welcome any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. We've been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers. Um, I'll have a few questions about the independence of DOI, and then I'll proceed to the preliminary budget. So I put two proposals on the table for consideration mm -hmm. by a Charter Commission revision, revision commission. Uh, one is to have the City Council play a role in the removal of a DOI commissioner, and the second is to empower DOI with an independent budget. What, what are your thoughts on those proposals? There is nothing more important than an independent, non-political law enforcement force in a civil democracy. 
and there is nothing more important to me than the independence of DOI. It is something that I have worked very hard to preserve over the last four years. And so I would well, I clearly welcome both the support and any steps that will strengthen and f that will further strengthen um, the independence and the non-political nature of DOI. Did my opening statement accurately characterize the resource constraints facing the NYCHA Inspector General? Yes, it did. Okay. Um, the NYCHA Inspector General does have lower fund, as you noted, um, the funding for parallel positions at NYCHA versus parallel positions in um, what is sometimes called main DOI, but I am trying not to use that phrase anymore because all of our inspector generals are part of DOI. But there is a gap in funding. Um, I believe it comes to about $147,000 over the 47 positions. If I'm off by $1,000 or so, somebody sitting here will correct me, but it's about $147,000. Uh, it had We have, in fact, had some staff leave the NYCHA IG for other parts of DOI. Um, stability at the NYCHA IG is deeply important. Uh, we have also had conversations that have not yet been resolved with NYCHA about amending the MOU to give us a fixed percentage of money so that we are not in a position of needing to go back to NYCHA each time a line opens. Okay. Now, have you brought, how, how long has the, these pay disparities date back? How long has it persisted? We've certainly been having conversations with NYCHA about the pay disparities for about two years, but I am certain that the disparities date farther back than that, but our first conversations, is that two years ago? Okay. About two years ago is when we started having the conversations, but the disparities themselves assuredly date back further than that. And what are NYCHA's reasons for rejecting your funding request? Um, the reasons that we have gotten essentially are that NYCHA <coughs> cannot afford any more money um, for oversight. Okay. Now, there's no institution that's more financially distressed than the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, how well funded is the Inspector General for the Health and Hospitals Corporation compared to that for the NYCHA, uh, the, the New York City Housing Authority? Sure. The uh, the New York City Health and Hospitals IG is very well funded. We entered into an MOU with the Health and Hospitals Corporation, excuse me, New York City Health and Hospitals, now that it's been rebranded. Yes. Um, we entered into a MOU about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago with H&H &H that has significantly more funding and also significantly more autonomy than does the MOU with NYCHA. We have requested that NYCHA enter into a new MOU with us that is updated. The one that we have now is about 20 years old. We requested that they enter into an updated MOU with us that would essentially parallel the one with H&H. &H. To date, that hasn't happened. And what is NYCHA's response to the request for a new MOU? Um, to date, we've received a series of inquiries about details, but no response either accepting or rejecting. And regarding the funding request and the new MOU, have you brought your concerns to City Hall? Um, certainly our concerns are known at City Hall um, as well as at NYCHA about our funding concerns, and I've certainly met with Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn about it. And what has been the response from the Deputy Mayor? The Deputy Mayor's response uh, was that NYCHA didn't have the money. Okay. Did you let her know that Health and Hospitals is also financially distressed? Um, I, do, I, I don't want to speak to the exact details of the conversation, but I can assure you that we have made quite clear to NYCHA and to City Hall. It, it seems to me likely that they are aware of the financial condition of Health and Hospitals. Okay. A number of questions about the preliminary budget. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an observation about DOI, and please let me know if you disagree, but it, it seems to me under your leadership, DOI has undergone both a quantitative and a qualitative transformation. When it comes to the former, there's been a dramatic expansion of headcount. And when it comes to the latter, there seems to have been an equally dramatic expansion of mission. 
that DOI is no longer strictly limiting itself to fighting corruption. It seems to have taken a much broader role of overseeing the operations of city government. Is that a fair characterization that DOI has emerged more as an oversight institution, not to the exclusion of its anti-corruption role, but, but an expansion of its mission? Is that a fair characterization? Um, I think it is true that we have begun to look more systemically at problems, whether, the only thing I'm hesitating about is, is, the, is whether I'm comfortable saying that some of these things that we find are not corruption. If you define corruption narrowly as people taking bribes, then yes, I absolutely agree, but if you view corruption more as the failure of government to follow the rules and to do what it is supposed to do and deliver the services it is supposed to deliver, um, under that more broad definition, I just want to be careful about the word corruption. Having said that, there is no doubt that one of the things we have done in the last four years is to take a look at whether there are broader systemic problems that result in failure to follow <coughs> what we all agree are the rules to make sure that services are delivered. And I believe that that is an important role. I believe that although nobody was arrested as a result, nobody so f to date has been arrested as a result of our report on lead paint inspections, I believe that it is an important role for DOI to play to point out to the public and to this council that lead paint inspections were not going on, that there was a public health hazard, um, that false forms were filed. I believe that the work we did at the beginning of 2017 on ACS to point out that at the time ACS did not have a functioning 24-7 ability to deal with child abuse, although again, there were no arrests made. I believe that that is incredibly valuable work that will protect children and is an essential part of DOI's mission and ought to be. Now DOI's budget has two program areas, agency operations and, inspect and IG, Inspector General. Uh, when it comes to agency operations, DOI's budgeted headcount has gone from 155 positions in FY 2013 to 320 positions in FY 2019, a 106% increase. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Inspector General's IG, DOI's budgeted headcount has gone from 62 positions in FY 2013 to 75 positions in FY 2019. What, what accounts for the massive growth in agency operations, but the modest growth in IG? I think that, yeah, I think, I think a big chunk of that is an accounting rather than reality issue. Remember that um, the titles that OMB ascribes to people do not often reflect what they are doing. So that, for example, there are there are people doing investigative work who are not listed by OMB as investigators. And similarly, there are large numbers of people doing investigative work who are paid for by other entities. So for example, um, there are 47 um, staff at the, ins at the Inspector General's office for NYCHA. None of those show up in any OMB documents. So there has been a significant growth in the size of DOI, and while some of that growth assuredly has been in terms of central staff, because that is, an, frankly, we have a more robust IT staff now than we did before, both because we need to protect against um, the dangers of hacking and also because increasingly our work requires sophisticated computer forensics. You know, when we recently at Health and Hospitals arrested somebody on child pornography charges, we needed computer forensics to get around some of the walls this person had set up to hide the pornography that he was downloading. Um, so that, in fact, a person who's doing computer forensics for us may not be listed as an inspector general, but they're doing forensics work. So yes, there's been a large increase. Most of that, in fact, is people who are out in the field doing investigations. Are most of your investigators within the program area of agency operations or within the program area of Inspector General? Uh, 
Um, it's a mixture of both. Uh, but again, these are, I, I think it's important not to read too much into OMB classifications of positions. Data analysts, for example, may be, not be listed as being part of an I, of a agency IG, but obviously data analysts are full-time reviewing bank records and other bits of data to see where there is, you know, where there are cases. Why are the, you know, I, NYCHA pays for all of its investigators in the office of the NYCHA IG. Why is the, why, why is the IG program area not fully funded by MOUs with other agencies? Why do you take up a portion of that cost? I'm, I'm not sure I fully... So the office of the NYCHA IG, as mm -hmm. I, based on what you conveyed to me, pays for all of NYCHA's investigate, all of the investigators out of NYCHA's budget. That is correct. I, I, is that a pattern that holds true across every agency? No, okay. no. So there are some, it, it's a little bit complicated, and if I get too wonky, sure. and if I get too budget wonky, please stop me. So there are some agencies that are technically not mayoral agencies the New York City Housing Authority, the School Construction Authority, Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, because those are not technically mayoral agencies, we have with each of them an MOU in which they agree to be bound by all the rules that cover mayoral agencies. For example, mayoral agencies, we don't subpoena them. We simply send them something called an EO16 letter, and they give us documents that we need. Non-mayoral agencies sign an MOU with us in which they agree to be bound by all of this and they agree to pay for X number of lines. Then additionally, DOI gets an allocation from the city of, that comes to about three, a little over 300 lines. And then there are about 70 more lines that are technically DOI employees, but money is transferred to our budget from certain agencies. For example, HRA, we have an MOU with them under which they agree to essentially supplement the funding that we already have allocated to that. The result comes to a staff count of about 700. In a better world, DOI would simply get 700 lines to use as appropriate. And the reason I say that is that priorities change and needs change. So for example, right now, the number of people working at the NYCHA IG's office is fixed by MOU. The number of people working at H&H &H IG's office is fixed by MOU. Some of the people working at HRA are fixed by MOU. As it happens, these are all agencies that require the staffing. But if a year from now, we were to determine that, every, that there were there was less of a need at one of those places and a greater need at, say, the Administration for Children's Services, we do not have the ability to move lines around. Those lines are sort of frozen in a historical pattern. And so it does restrict our ability to move resources around. Um, so if I understand correctly, yeah. when it comes to non mayoral governing entities, whether it be public benefit corporations or public authorities, those entities fully fund, to the extent that those entities have an MOU with DOI, mm -hmm. fully fund their inspector generals, is that? That is correct. But with city agencies, the, some of the investigators might be on DOI's payroll and some of them might be on the agency payroll, is that? Is it a mix of the two with it city agencies? It is a mix. With city agencies, you know, with city agencies, it is primarily, though not exclusively, DOI payroll, okay. although in some instances, money is transferred by that agency to DOI's budget to pay the cost. But there are, in fact, some city agencies. For example, the Department of Correction. There are DOC, people who are technically DOC employees who work for DOI pursuant to a variety. The, the, there are a variety of different MOUs. Honestly, a lot of it is historical. Something goes wrong at an agency, everybody agrees for additional oversight beyond what we have is necessary. The agency and DOI enter into an MOU in which the agency agrees to give us X headcount. 
Sometimes that's done by simply having the agency give us the money and we hire. Sometimes technically they remain that agency's employees. In all instances, however, they report through our chain of command. When it comes to investigators beyond the payroll of DOI, how dramatic has, has, has your headcount expansion been? The headcount expansion beyond investigators has not been huge. Beyond had, investigators on DOI's payroll. On DOI's payroll. Yes. Um, the expansion, the biggest expansion would be the H&H. You know, two years ago, H&H &H was an independent IG. It had nothing to do with DOI. Um, we now have, what's that? We're budgeted for 75, so that's probably the largest expansion of non-DOI numbers. We also, as a result, as you may remember, back in May of last year, it developed that part of the Department of Corrections' own internal affairs group was listening in on DOI phone calls. The result of this was that part of DOC internal affairs was taken away from DOC and moved over to DOI. So that's, I believe it was 20 headcount that was removed from DOC and brought over to DOI. So I would say those are the, probably the two biggest, the two biggest expansions of non-DOI headcount are in those two places. Do you have a total number or do you want to get back to me on? A total number of it. Uh, the headcount now. The headcount expansion beyond investigators on your payroll. Um, it is, I can tell you that it is now 306, and if you want, we will get okay. you, we will get back to you with the, you know, what it was three years ago or four years ago, et cetera. We'll get you a, a year by year so right So DOI enters into MOUs with public benefit corporations, public authorities, for the purpose of treating them as city agencies for Correct. the purpose of investigations. Correct. Why enter into MOUs with city agencies when DOI has inherent authority over them? The MOUs with city agencies have nothing to do with the authority. We already have it. They have solely to do with funding. So, for example, um, there is an MOU with HRA. The, it doesn't give us any authority over HRA. It ba basically, it's an agreement with HRA. I think it's 20 if you want. Oh, got it. It, the, it is, we believe, 30, but we'll give you the exact number. It has nothing to do with our authority. It just says we are entitled to hire up to 30 additional staff to investigate benefits fraud by, you know, at HRA, and HRA will pick up the cost of those lines. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the reason for that, I'm, I'm being informed by people who are a lot smarter than I am and know a lot more than I do. Um, the only way to get OTDA, the state agency, to pay for this is to have it done through this mechanism. In other words, in order to, to get OTDA to reimburse the part of the cost of these investigations, it has to be done through this route. Understood. Um, one more question about headcount. DOI has a budgeted headcount of 415 positions, but an actual headcount of 363 positions. Um, from FY 2013 to FY 2017, DOI on average has had a budgeted headcount of 287 positions, but an actual headcount of only 269 positions. There seems to have been a, there seems to be a persistent gap between the budgeted headcount and the actual headcount. Why is that? Sure. So I believe that if you look at any city agency or, for that matter, any large corporate entity of any sort, you will see a gap between budgeted and actual because people leave and need to be replaced and there's a gap between them. Um, for DOI, in many instances, given the sensitive work we're doing, it can actually take longer than otherwise to find investigators. In fact, I will tell you, um, when we initially took over the 20 positions from DOC, um, although we were taking DOC people, the DOC people had to pass our background screening, which is more rigorous than DOC's, and it has taken a long time. We are not fully, that is not fully staffed yet, or it's almost fully staffed, because a number of people who we would have taken could not pass our background screening process, leaving positions open. I believe that our 
vacancy rate is about 10%, and I'm told that the citywide average is about 12. So if anything, I think our vacancy rate is a little bit lower than the city's. But that is really the function of the fact that when somebody that in an agency with roughly 700 people, some number of people leave at any given time. Also, many of those of the set of the vacancies were now at what? 7,700. Of the whole 700, there are, n there are 93 vacancies, but really 20 of those will be filled momentarily. In other words, we have okay. candidates, they you know, they are going through the background screening what, process. What if we were to disaggregate it? Are there, are there squads or offices of, of, of Inspector General where you've had particular challenges with recruitment and retention and, and vacancies? Sure. Um, as you alluded to in your testimony, uh, the fact that we pay, that on average there is on the fact that on average um, there's a lower pay at NYCHA has certainly made it more difficult to recruit, and we have in fact had some people leave NYCHA, the NYCHA IG for other parts of DOI. Um, squad one, that is the Rikers, uh, Rikers Island, the jails, has been particularly um, troubling to get good people. Um, we are still H and H. Actually, we have more vacancies there bluntly than I would like. Part of that is that a big chunk of what, we're, what we need to hire there are forensic accountants and auditors. And I can honestly say that forensic getting, hiring good forensic accountants and auditors is arguably the hardest type of investigative slot to fill. Overtime. Uh, DOI's overtime expenditures have risen from 212,000 in FY 2013 to one mil to is it one million or one million? Okay. One million in FY two thousand nineteen. What is driving the astronomical growth in overtime? Um so the growth of overtime and it, it that's a growth over a number of years. It was um, in fiscal year twenty seventeen it was nine hundred and twenty six thousand um, and fiscal year 2018, we're on track for 1.1 million. Um, it has grown. Part of that is because all of DOI's work has grown. Uh, we are doing more work with more, we are doing more work with more staff um, and lots of the work that we do in NYCHA, in DOC, uh, require, if you're doing cases involving um, large-scale drug operations, whether it's the Sheephead, Sheepshead Nostrand case where we arrested 16 people for running a large-scale drug operation out of that NYCHA complex, or the Rikers work that we've done, um, that stuff doesn't happen nine to five, and so it requires, and the more you do this kind of work, and I think it's very valuable work if we're going to keep places safe, requires more overtime. Although, to keep it in perspective, um, Although, can I ask, interject sure. for a moment? Is, is this a transitional surge in overtime? Because I, what I worry about is a trajectory that might be unsustainable, right? right. Is, is, is over, are overtime expenditures going to quadruple over the next four years again? Or do you believe this is a transitional surge? I believe it's transitional. I do not believe they're going to quadruple again. Um, and for whatever it's worth, just as a matter of perspective, um, our overtime now is about 1.9% of our budget. Um, I believe the NYPD's, so it's a little under 2%, I believe the NYPD is about 13%. So we are spending less on overtime than the NYPD. Well, that um, might be a low bar, Commissioner, but I, <laughs> I think the NYPD has a special status in city government. So. Um, I, add in, in many, as, do, as do we, obviously. So I, just to keep that in perspective, I don't believe that we're going to see a quadrupling again of it. Um, but my other concern is that a chunk of our overtime do, is not reflected in the budget because it is paid for by forfeiture funds. The problem is forfeiture funds are not infinite. Um, DOI did a case a number of years ago that brought in a huge amount of forfeiture funds, more than we normally do. That money will run out, and that money for overtime will run out, and so we are going to be increasingly dependent on the city's budget for overtime. But I think we're going to be reasonably stable over the next couple of years. So DOI has a just 
a widely varied, complex function in city government. Um, DOI conducts Vendex checks, background checks. You serve as the investigative arm for COIB. You investigate corruption. You oversee operations. So I'm going to have qu I have some uh, various questions about jurisdiction because not only do you have DOI as the centralized investigative force in city government, but each agency might have its own investigative unit. Mm -hmm. And knowing the jurisdictional differences between the two can be um, complicated. Uh, one is what, is, what is the difference in jurisdiction between the Commission to Combat Police Corruption and the NYPD Inspector General? Sure. So the Commission to Combat Police <coughs> Corruption was created by executive order a number of years ago, and it essentially serves an advisory role with regard to the NYPD. They review a certain number of IAB cases each year, and then advise the police commissioner and occasion, and I believe they issue an annual report on whether or not certain IAB functions, meaning the NYPD's own Internal Affairs Bureau, has handled its work correctly. The Department of Investigations Inspector General for the NYPD is the independent inspector general for the NYPD charged with reviewing not merely IAB functions, although we do have jurisdiction over that, but over the entire NYPD to look at whether the NYPD, A, has engaged in illegal activity, B, has engaged in activity that is in violation of its own regulations, C, has engaged in, quote, waste, fraud, or abuse, meaning the improper, you know, the obviously improper use of resources, and D, uh, whether the NYPD has taken actions that negatively affect the civil rights of New Yorkers. It's a very broad, we have a very broad mandate. Why have two distinct entities? Why not centralize them? Right now, there are, I suppose, four different entities that look at the NYPD. Um, there is IAB, which is the Department's Internal Affairs Bureau. And all, most agencies have some form of internal affairs bureau. I think it is important for agencies to have an internal affairs bureau. I would note that, A, this council, when it passed Local Law 70, obligated internal affairs to report to DOI on certain trends or other issues. Mm -hmm. And B, under Executive Order 16, uh, which has been in place for at least, I think, 30 years, every city's internal affairs group has an obligation to stand down if DOI sends them written notice saying that we are investigating something. As a general rule, we tend not to send a lot of stand down requests because we think that additional investigations are important, but there have been times in other agencies where we have in fact said to um, an internal affairs group, please stand down, we are going to do this and we don't want anybody else looking at it until we've had a chance. But you have the authority to review police, mis police misconduct, Absolutely. Police operation. So what is, what is the difference or overlap between CCRB and, that's um, a, and DOI? That's a great question. Um, and it is one that we have devoted considerable thought to over the last four years and one that to some extent experience is teaching us, has allowed us to evolve our thinking in. I mean, if I, my thinking is different now than it was four years ago. CCRB has a large staff that investigates individual instances of police misconduct, um, right? And they have a large staff. Their staff is actually larger than the uh, DOI's IG staff. They do individual instances of misconduct, both smaller instances of misconduct and very serious instances of misconduct. Um, it would be impossible for DOI to replicate that work absent essentially taking on the entire staffing mechanism of the CCRB. What DOI does is we are empowered to look at both individual instances of misconduct and systemic problems. What we've tried to do, and we've tried to do this with all of the agencies, um, but especially so in the case of the police because there is a CCRB, is rather than simply viewing individual cases in isolation, we have tried to, where there has been police misconduct we have tried to look at it as a systemic matter. In other words, to go beyond did officer so did officer X, you know, 
engage in misconduct on this date, but is there a broader problem that goes beyond what Officer X did? Um, and I think that what you've seen in a lot of the reports that we've issued and what you will see in some future work that will be coming out of that Inspector General's office during the course of this year is an ability to look more broadly. So for example, not just did the NYPD improperly surveil a particular political organization on a particular date, but a detailed review of whether the NYPD was improperly surveilling political and religious groups and did they have the infrastructure in place to make sure that they didn't do so in the future? And what we found was that they were that in fact there was improper surveillance going on and improper um, checks on surveillance, and that was the kind of thing that could only be done by DOI because it has to be done by an entity that is independent from the police department, but that is also a law enforcement agency and therefore can have access to highly confidential documents. You and I had a, I, although I just want to challenge, I, I do think action in individual cases could affect systemic change, right? If individual officers are held accountable for misconduct, and I, what role can DOI play in holding officers accountable for misconduct? And later on, I'm going to ask you about some of the exposés that we've seen in the New York sure. Times. And sure. So I agree with you that individual cases can be a vehicle for dealing with systemic conduct. And especially in, in matters of policing. Especially, I agree with you, and I agree with you, especially in matters of policing. And, and I want to be very careful here because, as you know, we do not ever speak about ongoing investigations or even acknowledge the existence of ongoing investigations. And so with that very clear caveat, I agree with you completely about the importance of doing individual cases, including individual, I agree with you as a general matter on the importance of doing individual cases, including individual criminal cases, as a way of dealing with systemic problems. I agree with you as, on that as a principle. Um, what about and, practice? And I am committed to, I believe we have put that into practice at many agencies. We are committed to that principle putting that principle into practice at the NYPD as well. But beyond that, I'm not going to discuss it. I'm going to press you on this, Commissioner. The Inspector General has been in place for how many years? Two or three? Four. Four years. Um, have you brought any cases against individual officers for misconduct or malfeasance? We have not brought cases. That, that Inspector General's office has not brought individual cases to date. And why is that? To date, the investigations that we have done have been looking at broader systemic issues that have not um, presented themselves for individual prosecutions. Um, I believe that, well, I believed that there were other vehicles for effectively handling this we are reconsidering whether there are effective, there are alternate effective vehicles for handling individual prosecutions. And as a result of that reconsideration, uh, we are rethinking how we are handling certain investigations. So and you that is a rethinking process that I and senior staff are going through. If your question is why did what, it what take us four years to rethink it, because none of us are perfect. Fair enough. No, I appreciate the admission of. Um, okay, so you're shifting toward a focus on individual cases. It sounds we have always had at DOI and an, a, a influence on individual cases. We've arrested 726 people last year, including, you know, to give you a fairly two fairly recent examples. We arrested 17 asbestos inspectors for falsifying asbestos safety reports expressly as a way to demonstrate the need for wholesale change in the way we do asbestos inspections in New York City. We've arrested multiple general contractors 
for violating DOB regulations that resulted in people getting killed and brought manslaughter charges expressly as a way of demonstrating that there needs to be a change yeah. in the way safety is done. We are rethink we are always rethinking how we do all of our investigations, but certainly we are rethinking how police investigations need I, to be done. I want to press on this because DOI will often tell the number of arrests, the number of investigations, and, and you show no trepidation about arresting malevolent actors and other agencies. Why the trepidation with the NYPD? I would quibble with the phrase trepidation. Um, I would like But you do treat the NYPD differently than you do other agencies when it comes to really the, the, the anti-corruption law enforcement function of DOI. Is that a fair observation? It seems like your role in relation to the NYPD is oversight. But is that? Uh, I don't know, as I said, I don't know that I would agree with the word trepidation. Um, I think if you look at some of the reports we have issued vis-a-vis -vis the NYPD and the response uh, that those reports have engendered from the NYPD, I don't believe they would feel as though we have treated them with kid gloves or with trepidation. But those are oversight reports. So e earlier in our conversation, mm -hmm. you said you had an expansive conception of corruption. Mm -hmm. Is excessive force, is police brutality, do, do those fall within the meaning of corruption as you understand it? Yes. And What about test lying this phenomenon that the New York Times has chronicled? Mm -hmm. Does that fall within the meaning of? Absolutely. So, so why not? investigate individual cases of test lying, excessive force, police brutality? So in 2015, we issued a report which, among other things, found, we reviewed, I believe it was 107, if I'm off by one or two, forgive me, um, instances of excessive force that were presented, I want to make sure I'm getting these numbers exactly right, and if I get the numbers off by even a little bit, somebody will um, somebody will correct me, um, in which excessive force was substantiated by the CCRB, and in roughly a third of the, we found that in 36% of instances where we independently verified that the CCRB was correct in terms of excessive force and presented evidence of excessive force to the police commissioner, <coughs> the police commissioner nonetheless declined to discipline the officer. We wrote that report in 2015, and we wrote it um, as the beginning of a review of excessive force and as an attempt to say this is an issue that needs to be taken more seriously. Since then, as you know, we issued a follow-up report on the recording of excessive force, which concluded that to this day, the NYPD is under-reporting the use of force. I don't wish to go into present investigations except to say that we take, I take extremely seriously excessive force. I take extremely seriously false statements. I will also say that turning such cases into criminal cases as opposed to civil CCRB matters is remarkably difficult in a lot of different ways and requires a huge amount of work both from us and from the relevant DAs. But it is absolutely an issue. It is an issue over no, which we have jurisdiction. And I know it's, one that we're it's concerned incredibly about. complex. My only concern is that there have been zero cases. And I think we all recognize that there's a small subset of officers who drive a disproportionate share of CCRB complaints, lawsuits, police brutality, uh, but it's one thing to have a report on those subset of officers. It's something else to actually hold them accountable. And, and I want the city to be in the business of actually holding the worst actors in the NYPD accountable for driving a disproportionate share of excessive force or Tesla lying or whatever problems have been identified. I agree with you. And I agree with you, although I would also point out that part of the reason that we write these reports, and there will be more of them in the coming year, Part of the reason for writing the reports is so that the public, so that the council, so that the mayor, so that the police commissioner, so that everybody is aware of this. The first thing that needs to happen is 
if the NYPD, and as I said, this was these numbers are now several years out of date, if the NYPD fails to discipline some large percentage of officers where they are given incontrovertible proof of excessive force, that is a real problem, and it is one that requires examination. But, but it seems to me you have more... I, I obviously yeah. do, not, I do yeah. not have the power to discipline officers. I actually don't technically have the power to indict officers. A DA has to do that. Yeah. I do have the power to arrest police officers, um, although I would not, to be honest, I would not arrest an officer without knowing that a DA was going to prosecute them. That strikes me, would strike me as an abuse of, of my powers. Um, in order to do that, you need to work with a DA, but I also would suggest that some of these are questions that ought to be posed of the city and of NYPD, and part of the power of DOI is to point out where the disciplinary process has broken down. But there's often denial. I mean, it's often the case that the NYPD will reject the recommendations of both CCRB and the NYPD Inspector General. The difference between DOI and CCRB is that DOI has the, can actually take action against individual officers. That is true, and it is something that we are keenly aware of, and I acknowledge that to date, the, to date, the work we have done vis-a-vis -vis the NYPD and the problems we have seen have not result have not to date resulted in arrests. I have a few more jurisdictional questions. Sure. Uh, what is the difference in jurisdiction between the Special Commissioner of Investigation and the Office of Special Investigations at the DOE? Oh, so the Office of Special Investigations is DOE's internal. It is the equivalent of IAB for mm -hmm. the NYPD and ID for DOC. That's their internal <laughs> folks. Um, generally, when they get and when they generally get complaints, they send them to us. Some small number we will deal with because they're serious enough, and most of them we will then send back to them to handle because they're clearly just disciplinary matters. The special commissioner for investigation, also known as the inspector general for the Department of Education, is the in, is D, is the inspector general reporting to me part of DOI? It's called Squad Eleven internally. That is the DOI inspector general who does investigations, recommends discipline, make, you know, et cetera. It's the difference between IAB oh, and, straightforward. and the yeah. There was a New York Times article recently about a, it portrayed a dispute between you and the DOE regarding the um, special commissioner of investigations. Mm -hmm. I was not clear on the nature of that dispute. Can you? Well, neither was I. Okay. Um, to be honest, neither was I. So very honestly, one, the most important thing to note is the mission of the Inspector General's office hasn't changed. The Inspector General has always reported to DOI and continues to and will, and most importantly, will continue to be independent of the Department of Education. Um, I will tell you that it, no, we have made some managerial, as I alluded to in my testimony, we've made some managerial and structural changes to better integrate both, for a variety of reasons, we have made managerial and structural changes to both the NYPD IG and the Department of Education IG to bring them within, fully integrated within DOI so that they can and will be doing the same kinds of work that all of DOI does, which also goes back to your question about have we been treating the NYPD differently? We are now fully integrating that function within DOI. That's something we've done fairly recently. Um, I will tell you that at no time, while the New, the New York Times reported that there was a conflict, at no time has anyone from the Department of Education contacted me or anyone on my staff to object to anything we're doing. So I'm not quite sure where the controversy is either DOE certainly hasn't objected to us. And what we are doing is simply making sure that those two squads, the police and DOE, are fully integrated within DOI and handle cases in the same consistent way as the rest of DOI. I think that that is important, and I think that although both of those squads have done enormous good work, um, and I think you will see in the fairly near future a further display of that, um, this will allow them to do even more good work, including as relates to some of the things we've discussed previously. So just wanna, I wanna see if I understand the changes that are at work. Um, you're, you're renaming the DOE Special Commissioner of Investigation, the Inspector General for the DOE? Well, 
by law, they are technically, will always technically be called the Special Commissioner for Investigation. Um, they are also called the Inspector General for DOE. That, that strikes me as a bit of nomenclature. I tend to refer to it as the IG because it is important that we have consistent work across the line. As a matter of law, they still have a separate additional title. And, and, and instead of the NYPD IG and the DOE IG reporting directly to you, to whom will those ultimately will report to you, but who's the immediate right. supervisor? Everybody ultimately reports to me. Each of those, the way that the Department of Investigation is structured, every inspector general reports to an associate commissioner. The associate commissioners are people with tremendous experience in law and with 20, 30 years of experience in law enforcement in many cases. Um, each, there are three associate commissioners. All of the IGs report to one of those associate commissioners. The associate commissioners in turn report to Susan Lambiasi, who's my deputy commissioner for investigations, who's also had an extremely long career in law enforcement, starting out at the Brooklyn DA's office. They report to my first deputy, who is in charge of running the office on a day-to-day -day basis, who reports to me. Um, and this will, in fact, allow me to be more involved in both of these IG's offices because rather than having to deal carve out time for day-to-day -day work, it allows me through this staff, and we have, I believe, I and my first deputy and my deputy commissioner and my associate commissioners have developed what I believe has been an extraordinarily effective model for handling cases, and this will allow us to leverage all of that experience. I have many more questions, Commissioner, but I'm gonna actually allow my colleague Keith Bowers to ask a few questions. So. Thank you, good sure. to see you, and thank you for that testimony. And it's never easy to be on the microphone with Richie Torres, so <laughs> I uh, commend you on that. Um, I, I, I know the conversation at the beginning started about um, ways to ensure that DOI is more independent, and I, uh, I commend Councilmember Torres for some ideas about how to ensure the independence, whether it's with, through an independent budget or through consent of the city council. The other thought that one might have is, well, I, let me take a step back. The, the process as it currently stands for, for your appointment, if I recall, was to be nominated by the mayor and then be uh, uh, with the consent of the city council. Is that correct? Yes, I was nominated by the mayor and then confirmed by the council. Great. And your, you, sir, you currently serve until further notice without any fixed term or there's no, there's no year cap on your, your, uh, uh, your job. Is that you're, correct? You're stuck, you're stuck with stuck me for with a good you. long while. Well, I, I think you're doing a good job, so I'm well, okay being stuck with you. So, um, but another idea would be on terms of independence is to create a fixed term that lasts beyond any particular administration or city council member or otherwise. Any thoughts on something like that? I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, there are instances. You know, the, the most notable instance is the FBI. You know, the FBI director's term is 10 years for several reasons. One, it, it by definition, expand, extends beyond any one administration. Right. Second of all, very bluntly, I think it probably takes roughly that much time to do a good job. Um, I'd like to believe I've done a good job in my first four years here. Uh, I believe I have, but I am acutely aware, even if I'm not going to list right now, all of the things that I have not yet done and all of the changes that have not been made, not because we're not everybody on my staff working practically 24 hours a day, but because change takes time, investigations take time. I mean, understand that the big investigations that people talk about coming out of DOI are usually 16 to 18 month long investigations from the time they start. And in many instances where there's a troubled agency, it can be two years after we decide that there's real trouble at an agency before we're turning out the kind of work that can do that. And, and presumably you inherited some casework that a predecessor had and you will at some point in time hand off yes. work to because of the multi-year process. And, and by the way, I should say, I inherited, I'm very, very lucky, I inherited from my predecessor a remarkable staff. I inherited 
although we've added a lot to that staff, we inherited a remarkably talented staff and a remarkable legacy of work, which has made everything that we've done in the last four years possible. We didn't have to start from scratch in a lot of places, and that's made it possible. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to my predecessor, um, and I feel, therefore, an obligation at whatever time it is that I'm done with this to hand over an agency in even better shape to my successor. But as I said, I think you're stuck with me for a while. I'm not... I'm, Hopefully not going anywhere. Yeah, and, 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 and my point being that, and particularly in the Department of Investigations, more than any other agency I can think of, having, I, I think, Sharon Councilmember Torres' statement about independent budget or uh, other ways to, re to ensure that you're not, you're not uh, uh, subject to the political moment, whether it's at the council or the administration, it's important to me as a, as a council member, but also as a taxpayer, to ensure that we have an uh, independent oversight body in the city. Um, I want to move to DOC um, and the sure. Department of Corrections. And you noted with the department, uh, the NYPD, that the, the DOI is investigating, and I know you guys were just discussing it, investigating the larger systemic issues rather than the individual uh, uh, employees or individual cases. Is that the same with the DOC? Um, it's been different with DOC, uh, which has followed a bit more of a traditional DOI model to date. Um, and as I spoke to before, we are now bringing everything within one entity. Uh, so we've arrested, <coughs> since we started our sort of large-scale look at DOC, we've arrested, I think, about 80 people, including 23 correction officers for contraband smuggling, for sexual assault, for violence. Um, in addition to all of those arrests, we've issued a number of reports dealing with the failure to properly staff and hire and screen dock employees, the failure to properly set up checkpoints to prevent contraband smuggling. All of that work is, and all of that work is continuing. And on the contraband issue, you had a report just a few weeks ago, really, yes. about continued failures at two complexes, the Manhattan Detention Complex, Book and Detention Complex. Presumably, if you looked at the other ones as well, you've done past actions on it. it seems like a, both an individual failure and a systemic failure to continue to keep people secure, uh, particularly we're talking about when employees, in this case, in this, uh, were, were able to bring in contraband at the two facilities. Um, any status on, uh, can you, do you have any, it was only a few weeks ago, but any any update on the status of the recommend, the DOC agreed to your recommendations. Do you have any updates on status, timeline, and if not yet implemented, when we might believe? I think it was four recommendations when those would be implemented. Sure, that's a great question, um, and it grows to a broader point, which is we issue reports and make recommendations, and frequently, though not always, they get accepted. But the bigger issue is not does somebody accept the recommendations, but do they actually implement them? And one of the things that we plan to do over the course of this year is a much harder look at not merely whether recommendations are accepted, but whether they're implemented. And our plan is that by the end of this year, we will have pub be able to post publicly for every city agency all of the recommendations, and not only whether they were accepted, but whether they were actually implemented, so that citizens, New Yorkers, and frankly, this council will be able to actually go and see not only did they say they would do it, but have they done it. And one of the real issues that we've had at DOC is that while they've agreed to many of our recommendations, they agreed to many of the recommendations that we made two years ago about contraband smuggling, and yet what this report demonstrated was that even though they'd agreed to these recommendations, they weren't actually implemented because if they had been, we wouldn't have been able to smuggle in scalpel blades and marijuana and suboxone into all of these facilities. It was clear if you'd followed our recommendations from two years ago, we couldn't have smuggled the stuff in. We smuggled the stuff in it was clear they're not following them. So a lot of what our recommendations from the most recent report were really just saying, look, the stuff we told you about two, now three years ago, we meant it, it's important, do it. Um, they have now committed to doing it. We will go back again. Um, 
I imagine it will take a number of months for them to implement this, but we will go back again, and if they've implemented it, then the next time we try to smuggle scalpels and suboxone into the facilities, our guys will get stopped. And if they haven't implemented it, I will be back to this council and to this committee to say, despite all their statements, nothing's happened. Um, similarly, we made a huge number of recommendations to DOC about how they have to change their hiring practices. We are now in the process of examining whether or not they have accepted those recommendations. And when we conclude that investigation, we will issue a report and I will be back to this committee if you're not tired of me by then um, to comment on whether or not they actually followed up. And are there penalties for, in, in the case of the recent report, it was a, seems like it was a failure both to adopt your recommendations but then behave. I mean, there's systematic, there's systematic problems with security and then there's individual behavior where people right. don't, you know, a, 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 a metal detector goes off and somebody that ignores it. Right. Are there penalties for the, for the folks in any report or any investigation that uh, fail to actually meet their job requirements? I'm not, and I'm not calling for that, I'm just right. asking. No, no, it's, it's a great question. So. Obviously, where people are engaged in illegal conduct, for example, the report was, you know, the report went along with, to go back to um, Chair Torres's observation, which I completely agree with, that it is oftentimes necessary to do individual arrests to highlight a problem. That report accompanied the, seri the arrest of several officers who had, in fact, you know, both off several officers who were part of a network of contraband smuggling and the report followed with the arrest because the arrest, dem the arrest was a vivid demonstration of the broader problem. The report then demonstrated the broader problem. Where people simply are not following the rules in the sense of waving people through who shouldn't be, that's not criminal conduct. In some of those instances, we will make referrals to the agency recommending discipline. Sometimes we will and sometimes we won't and that's a judgment call based on a wide variety of factors. But certainly when we, do these when we do investigations and find people not doing their jobs in this way, we often make a disciplinary referral separate and apart from any criminal referral. Yes. Got it. So something that's more internal than criminal in terms right. of how to, how to be punitive. And, and on, we, there was a recent report from the Department of Corrections about sexual abuse. Uh, we noted a, a large increase in, um, in, in both uh, allegations and I think findings and a huge backlog in terms of investigations. Mm -hmm. It would almost strike you that there's almost a crisis uh, of, of behavior. Uh, it's, it's, and I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at any particular person or entity responsible to it. It's allegations come from, from based on a lot of reasons. But uh, what are your recent findings or beliefs in terms of uh, uh, sexual abuse within our direct Department of Corrections facilities? Right. So this is a huge, it is in fact a real problem. Um, 16 staff have now been modified as a result of DOI investigations, meaning they are no longer allowed contact with inmates as a result of our investigations stemming into sexual assault at Rikers and at other facilities. And I think it's important to say Rikers and other facilities because sometimes people lose track of the fact that right. there's Brooklyn House and there's right. um, Manhattan and all of the problems that exist, let me be very clear about this, all of the problems that exist on Rikers exist equally if not more so at the localized borough facilities. And I think that's an important fact not to lose track of, especially in the debate about closing Rikers. Mm -hmm. So we have, done, we have done and are doing a number of investigations into sexual assault at the city jails uh, we have arrested, um, we've already made some arrests in this regard. We have arranged for 16 staff to be modified. These are remarkably hard cases to do criminally for a variety of reasons. Um, nonetheless, we have made some arrests. We have arranged for an even larger number, 16 modifications, and I think that that work is going to be continuing for some time. It, <laughs> is, it is a genuine problem. Um, Bluntly, we would do more investigations if we had more staff. 
Got it. And, and you did mention that you had difficulty staffing for the DOC and Rikers and yes. other, and as you know, a very important point, there's more than Rikers Island in terms of what's under the jurisdiction of DOC. What, can you give us more reasons why or information or in terms of your challenges and difficulties staffing that? Sure. I mean, there have been several. One is, as I said, last year when it developed that um, Doc's Internal Affairs Division had been essentially eavesdropping on D improperly eavesdropping on DOI phone calls, a part of Doc's internal affairs group, the part, one of the parts that listens to phone, that monitors phone calls, which is an enormously time, monitoring phone calls is an enormously time consuming process that bluntly, for a variety of reasons that I'm not, I'd rather not go into in a public setting, cannot be made more efficient with computers. It is a huge time-consuming process. About 20 people were supposed to be sent over. Um, those people had to pass because they, although they would be technically DOC employees, they would be working for DOI, they would have access to DOI records, they would be in you know, DOI facilities, they had to pass our background screening process. And the number of people who got through the interview process and then couldn't get through the background screening process was significant. It was 20 that were supposed to come over? 20 were, 20 were supposed to come over. Not all of them were supposed to be DOC staff. I think it was 12 DOC staff, four DOC captains, and four civilian staff. Somebody's going to check the exact And, and they, were, they were current employees that were supposed to be sent over Correct. to become DOI. And the what, what four do civilian were going to just be hired by us. The other 16, did I do the math right? Yes, they did. The other 16, um, and somebody's checking those. I'm sorry, there's two captains, not four captains. 12 staff, two captains, four analyst, civilian analysts. There's two more. Somebody will find out what those other two positions and so were. So they were DOC employees that were then going to be transferred over Correct. to DOI. So are you, are you concerned? I, I, I'll share I might be, but are you concerned that there are employees at DOC who were doing work and that could not pass your background investigation? I am. Um, as, I, as I've said, and, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record on this, we obviously do not discuss ongoing investigations. But I will tell you that we are in the process of finishing, of, of our review of whether we issued a report two years ago about, do, about doc staffing. In other words, there, what we found was that in something like a third of all hires from one class, there were red flags in the hiring, meaning the people who had been hired either had known gang affiliations, they had prior felonies on their records, or some other you know, indicator that they clearly shouldn't be a DOC employee but got hired anyway. Um, we, are, we will be issuing a report this year, probably in the first half of this year, as to whether or not DOC is Doc made the changes we recommended and whether there still remain these kinds of red flags in the hiring. As I said, we do not discuss the contents of our investigations until they're completed, but at the point at which that report is completed, I'd be happy if this committee wants to come back and answer more detailed questions on that subject. Yeah, I, concern, I mean, I, I think if not, I'm the criminal justice chair, we can have you as well. But, um, uh, you know, I think we would all share some concern that there are employees who can't pa pa pass, and I'm sure you have a high standard, but have a, can pass a background. A background I, I, I share your concern. Thank you. Um, uh, just, and I'll, I'll end my, my comments. You have a, you have a backlog in terms of background checks. Yep. 6,000, some two, I don't know mm -hmm. the number, over 6,000. Um, so on a similar note, our, does that mean that we have folks who are working agencies right who are have accepted jobs or working that have not yet been received a background investigation? Yes. And it's it's maybe not six thousand, but it's in the thousands, I assume. It is. I mean, just and I just want to be careful that we don't set off it is a concern, but I don't want to set off a panic. Obviously, there are certain jobs that are particularly sensitive or particularly, you know, senior where we will get a call from an agency saying, we plan to hire this person for this very sensitive position. Can you please make sure it gets done before they start? And those will be kicked to the top of the pile. Indeed, one of the reason that you'll find that some number tend to linger is applications periodically for the most sensitive things jump the line. 
which is appropriate. I mean, right. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not criticizing. Them. Right. And I don't criticize agencies for periodically calling and saying this is a particularly sensitive position. Could you do? Could you kick this to the top of the line? Um, but yes, there are a reasonable number of people who are working um, whose backgrounds have not been completed. That is true. And every now and again, something bad happens, and we're reminded of it, and it is something that concerns me. Does that include teachers? Teachers go through a different backgrounding process that's handled by the Board of Education. Board of Education. So we do not we do not do teacher backgrounding. Got it. And is there any sort of sense of timeline by which the, for, you're going to be getting more, obviously, because we hire people all the time, but in your, if, if you had no new hires, what's the expected timeline that you think you would actually achieve getting through what's a 6,500? Oh, if we do not have new hires, that number will go up. Because obviously, at some point, we'll get through those 6,000. But, but more are being, coming in. When would your expected timeline be to get through the existing backlog? Oh, if there were, if, in other words, if the city never hired another right. person and I never had to do another background other than the ones we presently have, which we understand is not. Yep. We do how many city calls a year? How many do calls a year? Hang on. If you give me one second, I'll tell you exactly how many Is it many three? I mean, you have 2,700 last year that you closed. Okay. So, so if we closed 2,700 a year, so three, two, well, two under three and a years. half years. Okay. Two to three years. If we, at current staffing levels, it would be two plus years. Right. Right? Whatever 2,700 divided by 6,000. More math than I can do in my head, but if you want, I'll so have about three. It's close to three years. Close yeah. to three years. It would take that long to get everything done. Obviously, one, as I said, a certain number of things will jump. Obviously, new things are coming in. A, some of those will jump the line, as they should. But B, the number will, in fact, go up because more are coming in than are getting done. It will become, it tends to become more acute every four years every four years and especially every eight years where there's a new administration okay. because there tends to be an even greater influx at the senior levels and those sometimes take longer to do. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it off from there. Thanks. I'm going to ask a few questions before um, turning it over to Councilmember Yeager who's joined us. Um, I, I, I noticed you said that the localized borough-based jails mm -hmm. are, are as dangerous if not more so than Rikers Island. Yes. I want to tread carefully because I know you're in the business of evaluating compliance with policy rather than making policy judgments, but I took that to mean some skepticism about the plan to close Rikers Island and replace them with borough-based jails. Mm -hmm. Is there concern that those borough-based jails can be just miniaturizations of Rikers Island? Or? Right. So let me be very, very yeah. clear. I am not an elect. Un unlike yeah. all of you, I am not an elected official and so not, and, and so not in the business of setting city policy and priorities. The mayor has declared that Rikers should be closed, this council has declared that Rikers should be closed, and the Department of Investigation will do everything necessary to make that process work as well as possible. And so I, am I want to be very clear that I'm not taking a position on the closure of Rikers. Having said that, it is clear that the localized borough facilities that exist now, to, which are the ones that people are talking about using, have all of the same problems as Rikers, have all of the same issues of violence, of contraband smuggling, and in fact, we documented this to some extent in the most recent report we issued. So that if Rikers is closed, r closing Rikers and moving the population of Rikers to localized facilities in and of itself will not eliminate the violence or the contraband smuggling or the other issues that we are talking about about Rikers. Now, whether closing Rikers has other virtues is a question for the mayor and for the council right. and not for me. Whether closing Rikers could in some way help reduce violence is a question for jails professionals and not me. But what I can say as a matter of fact is that the simple closing of Rikers and moving to localized facilities, in and of itself, what we now know is that that does not have any impact on violence, contraband smuggling, and the related problems. 
So the notion that borough-based facilities are inherently safer than Rikers is not borne out by the facts as you understand them. That is absolutely okay. correct, yes. Uh, just a, f a few more questions about DOI has the authority to investigate city employees or those who do business with the city, contract with the city, mm -hmm. those who receive benefits from the city. Sure. What about those who, who lease land from the city? Would that fall within? Yes, absolutely. Um, people who lease land, several things. People who lease land from the city are absolutely within our jurisdiction. Um, and as you know, we have done investigations about um, city leases and things like that. Uh, additionally, people who, you know, people in the real estate industry who are regulated by DOB in terms of construction safety are very much within our jurisdiction. As you know, in the last two years, we've brought three manslaughter cases against general contractors who failed to follow DOB regulations and got workers killed. And that is part of a larger work that we are doing with all five DAs to try to use criminal penalties to basically clean up and make safer the construction industry. Now, one of the, as I understand, one of the entities leasing land from New York City is, is the MTA. As I understand, we technically own, <laughs> even though the MTA is a, 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 a New York City Transit Authority is a creature of state law, right. apparently New York City technically owns the infrastructure on which it operates, or at least the subways. Could the city's ownership interest in in the infrastructure of the MTA serve as the basis for establishing an inspector general? I want to be really careful how I answer this yeah. for several reasons. Um, as a technical matter, probably. However, two caveats here, both of which are extremely important. One, as you know, by state law, there is an inspector general of the MTA. State law mandates, and there is an independent inspector general's office at the MTA. By state law, the MTA inspector general is appointed by the governor. In order for DOI to, in, to do that work, it would be to do it in something other than a show, other than for show, which I don't believe in engaging in this work for show. I only, you know, in order to do that, we would A, be replicating the work of this state-created entity. I don't know what the staffing is there, but I would guess, I can, and we can get back to you on it, but I would guess they've got about 100 staff. For us to do this work either wholesale on our own or, you know, as has been done before through an MOU in which the MTA agreed that their IG would then report through DOI, would require the hiring of 100 people. It would require a massive commitment of time from the senior central staff at DOI. Um, if this council or the mayor were to direct us to do so, we, sir, you know, you folks are elected and we are not, and we, we would do it. But I think it would be a massive undertaking that would require an influx of resources vastly greater than anything we've ever seen. Now, now the statewide, the, the existing IG for the MTA has a statewide focus and reports to presumably the state legislature, the governor. Yes. There's a debate about whether the city should invest resources in the MTA. Mm -hmm. right? We're debating whether we should invest in the MTA action plan. Yes. Um, I imagine that if the city does decide to invest resources, there's going to be a call for greater accountability on how city dollars are spent. Mm -hmm. And there's no IG that reports to the council or the mayor or the city at large. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I'm putting the right. idea. And, that's the context in which I'm asking the question. I am absolutely sympathetic to that point. I mean, I'm obviously not going to get... A, I have no opinion on whether how the city should fund the MTA or whether the city should fund the MTA. That is so far beyond my swim lane that... I can barely see that part of the pool. And that's not my question. Right. So. But the answer is I am entirely sympathetic to the idea that the city has no f effective oversight of the MTA the way it does of every other part of every other thing the city funds. What I would caution, and if 
the council and the mayor wanted that oversight, DOI would obviously be the place to provide it because we have the infrastructure. But I would want to caution that before we walk down that road, in order to do it in a meaningful, I mean, I could assign one person to think about, but in order to do it in a meaningful way in which I could come before this council once a year and say, we are doing our job, would require a, mat would essentially require taking the present MT, part of the present MTAIG or a big chunk of it and moving it over to the city or a massive influx of resources and honestly a massive use of time at the, at the top of DOI, meaning, I mean, you can see my deputy commissioner for investigations turning slightly green at the thought of this. It would be a massive, massive right. It could be a prohibitive undertaking, for all I know. Right. Um, and I, I would certainly want considerable time to think about it and talk with my staff about it before I spoke about it yeah. beyond that. I, I, these are purely academic questions, but one more, one more academic question. Um, given the city's ownership interest in, mm -hmm. in the subway system, do you think that DOI has the authority to oversee the MTA in the absence of an MOU, or would it require an MOU? As, as a legal matter? Um, DOI, I believe, and I would really like the opportunity to sit with my general counsel sure. before, and I, I'm happy to have, I, would I believe the answer is yes, that we have that authority, but I would actually like the ability to sit with my general counsel and write you a follow-up letter, if that's okay. At whatever, is, whatever, on your terms, absolutely. Yes, we are, I'm happy to get back to you about that. I'd like a chance to actually discuss that with, uh, counsel, with general counsel staff meaning the lawyers at DOI, um, so that I don't say something that no. demonstrates why I stopped being a lawyer a couple of years ago. Fair enough, Commissioner. Um, Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. I, st I stopped being a lawyer on December 31st. <laughs> um, well, I guess once a lawyer, we're always a lawyer, right? Right. No, uh, no, no, you'd be surprised. Do you feel better? I, uh, I call myself a recovering lawyer. <laughs> um, I, I apologize for my tardiness. I was at a hearing across the street, so if I ask something that uh, was previously covered, just say previously covered and go watch the tape, and I'm okay <laughs> with that. I won't be insulted. Um, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, the background check unit closed 2,782 uh, investigations in 2017. Um, the, uh, your performance indicators indicate that there's a 300 day average time to complete a background investigation. Uh, that's what your target is, that's what you're hoping for. You want more staff to get, to close that number. If, uh, if an employee or, or, or putative, a prospective employee is required to undergo a background check uh, as a condition of employment, do they actually start the job prior to having the employment uh, yes. check? Okay, so they could be on the job prior to, then what happens in, you know, 300 days later, you come back and say this guy should not be hired. Um, well, by the way, just to be clear, we never say to an agency you should or should not hire right. the person. Just we, bring the indicators. Right. We basically say to the agency, we have done the background check and we have either developed no adverse information or we've developed the following adverse information. And also understand that adverse information is a really broad, I mean, we will literally say this person has X number of unpaid parking tickets. Often commissioners will decide, will basically say to the employee, go pay the parking tickets. I'm not, you know, I still want the person, and I'm just gonna tell them to pay the parking tickets. So we don't say hire, don't hire, we say here's the adverse information. If we, if somebody is working there and we send uh, the commissioner a letter after they've started that says here's the adverse information, the commissioner then has to decide, given the adverse information, given what I now know about this person's performance, do I wanna fire them or do I wanna allow them to continue in much the same way that if we send adverse information before somebody's hired, the commissioner or relevant hiring person then needs to decide, um, do I still want to hire this person anyway or do I want to not hire them? Okay. I know um, you're, you know, as the, with a the very specific mandate that you have, you, as I heard uh, your testimony before, you tend to shy away from the broad policy statements because you've said that's not really your thing. and. You, you give the facts and you know you let everybody else do the policy stuff. Um, but would you feel comfortable with a, with a process or even a statute, a rule, a regulation within the city of New York that if, some, if a particular job is subject to a background inv investigation by your agency, uh, that, a, that that position can't be filled until the investigation is complete? 
I think that that would present real logistical problems for this reason. Um, there is a huge backlog in doing background investigations. You can only do so many, ba an investigator can only do so many in background investigations per year. I mean, it's just it, their time and space being finite. Um, there is a huge backlog. Uh, I think that you, it would cripple the ability of many agencies to do hiring. Now, what I will tell you is that generally where an agency is hiring somebody in a particularly sensitive or important or high profile position, they will often call us and say, we want to hire so-and-so, it's a particularly sensitive position, can you kick this to the top of the pile because we really want it done before we hire them? And as a general rule, we will accommodate that. Indeed, part of the reason for the backlog and for some things taking as long as they do is the number of things that jump the line. Um, ultimately, as I said, I don't opine on policy and, and that would be up to this council and the mayor. I think that you would find that it could have a crippling effect on the city's ability to hire uh, workforce. Okay. Um, do you do background checks on employees of this council, not member staff, but uh, central staff? No, we do not. Not at all? No, we only do it for mayoral agencies. All right. Um, God bless us. This council is about to hire 125 people, uh, notwithstanding my no vote on the council's budget last week. Uh, to the tune of approximately $15 million from good people like that. Um, would, you, would you support a law in the city that would require that uh, this council's employees with the same, with the same um, definitions as those of mayoral agencies that require DOI background checks uh, also be subject to background checks? Respectfully, I would leave to the city council to decide the requirements for their own hiring. I don't believe it's my place to opine on that. Nor mine, um, I think. Um, you, uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, uh, Rikers and the closing and the uh, outer borough uh, uh, facilities, which I think, uh, as you indicated, and, and very rightfully, they're, they're often unmentioned in the discussion about Rikers because it's close Rikers, close Rikers, close Rikers, and then what? Um, let's build these borough facilities, and then what? And the, the then what is where you come in and say, folks, listen, the same problems you have at Rikers, except for the part of that being on an island, uh, you have at every borough facility. Um, uh, do you believe that the city is ready to simply build these borough facilities right now with the management of, of DOC the way it is um, with the with the indicators that you're finding, with the uh, with the repeated problems that you know you're addressing, you're pointing out the issues and not being addressed. Do you believe that the city is ready to just start building these out of our facilities? Well, as I said, um, whether or not Rikers should be closed is a decision to be made by the mayor and by this council, and not for me. Um, and we at DOI, and let me be very clear, we will be absolutely supportive of whatever decision is made and whatever timeline is made, and we will do everything we need to do to help make that a success. I think it is clear from the most recent report we issued that the problems that exist at Rikers also exist equally at the localized borough facilities, and so that the mere act of building a series of facilities and moving the present population both of inmates and of correction officers to those facilities will result in seeing all of the problems on Rikers spread out throughout these other facilities. So that if Rikers is going to be closed and if that closure is going to in fact solve the problems we're seeing, something beyond merely the construction of facilities and the disbursement of people off the island will need to take place. Okay. So um, and again, with the understanding, obviously, you don't do the policy stuff, you do the facts and you just present them. Uh, should, should not DOI be called on to go back out and take another look at Rikers and say clean and green, give a check mark, give a, give a green light before uh, the Rikers closing and the building of these borough facilities and, you're, and, and DOI is able to say everything we've pointed out in report A and then report B because you indicated that they didn't pay attention to report A necessarily, mm -hmm. um, that yes, we give them a clean bill of health, ready to go. Well, and, and I'm, not say, I'm not even saying that this is something that you have to decide on your own right. to do. I'm just asking, um, you know, mm -hmm. between us, 
uh, with nobody else listening. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that something that it just makes sense to do? Well, obviously, we continue to write reports about what's going on both at Rikers and at localized facilities. And we, in fact, this most recent report dealt exclusively with localized facilities. And I can assure you that over the course of the next year, you will be seeing additional reports from us about issues at Rikers. I don't know that there's ever a situation in which we give an agency a, quote, clean bill of health. Fair enough. Um, not because there aren't many agencies that are incredibly well run. There are, I should say, in the city of New York, a large number of agencies that are incredibly well run. But our function, you know, our function is not sort of like a general practicing physician to give somebody a clean bill of health. Our function is to be constantly looking because even something that is well run today can have a problem tomorrow. We will, regardless of whether the city's inmate population is housed on Rikers, on, is housed, <coughs> I guess about 70% of the inmate population is housed on Rikers. I may have that number wrong. If I do, I apologize. But regardless of whether the bulk of the population is housed on Rikers or in localized facilities, we will continue the kind of work we've done that have resulted in, as I said, about 80 arrests, including 23 correction officers. We will continue the work we've done that have resulted in 16 uh, staff modified for sexual assault. We will continue that work regardless of where the inmates are housed. Yeah, and, and I don't doubt that, Commissioner, and uh, your work in the city in the last four years is, uh, forgive this, uh, description is certainly legendary in many respects, but um, what I would urge, and I would never uh, tell the commissioner uh, my, my thoughts on how to run the agency, it's not my job, it's yours, um, but I would, I would say that you have sort of a roadmap, um, things that you've identified in Rikers uh, that, that need broad, from the top, policy changes that filter in and make those changes, and I would say that at the very least, uh, before we can proceed to the next step, we would need DOI, I would need DOI, um, and I'm just one person here, but I would t need to see that you said, maybe not a clean bill of health, but these are the 20 things we pointed out, and on these 20 things, we've seen the movement in the direction that we're now confident, we're now, not not, we're now confident that, the, uh, that DOC is at the place where they've addressed our concerns, because you are the watchdog, you are the one, DOC's not identifying it, it's not us at the council, it's not the mayor, it's you. You're watching us. Right. I appreciate it. As I said, and, and one of the things I said is one of the things we will do, and this will be done by the end of the year, is we will list for every city agency where we have issued policy and procedure recommendations called PPRs. We will be able to list by the end of the year not only all of the PPRs and not only whether they were accepted, meaning the agency said, yes, we'll do it, but whether in our estimation they've been implemented. And so clearly one of those agencies will be DOC. And so you and this council and the public at large will have the ability by the end of the year to essentially look at a list of all the things that we have said need to be fixed at DOC and whether in our estimation that's happened. Right. I think that'll provide you with a very nice checklist. I think so as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, one question before I, um, oh, and then I'll hand it over to you. Yes. Mr. Chair, can I, I sure. I've just been told that I gave one piece of inaccurate information in my last uh, sure. set of answers. Can I clarify something? Absolutely. I'm told that we do do vetting on city council staffers, and we what we do is when city council staffers, we do vetting and we will um, tell the city council whether there are any substantiated DOI investigations about the staffer, but we don't do the fuller background review. So we do that piece of vetting but not a full background review. And I apologize for getting that Absolutely. wrong. Absolutely. Thank you. No, um, I appreciate you know, My apologies. One of the things that they teach us in law school, right, if we, uh, even if we make the error, we have to correct it right away uh, as soon as we get new information. I appreciate that. So let me just do a quick follow-up and then I'll, I'll give it back to the chairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, like, I, like I indicated at the beginning of my uh, questioning, uh, God bless us, we're gonna hire 125 people here. I don't know where we're gonna put them, but we're gonna hire them. Um, and you indicated that uh, you sometimes some things go to the top of the pile, uh, fast track. I don't know what term you use, but uh, for some kind of positions, they're, if they're more important they, and you have to do a background check, you put them at the top. Did I, am I phrasing that wrong? Or? Yes. No, we will. In other words, we will be told that there are certain positions that are particularly important and they will go to the top of the line. Who tells you that? Oh, the, in other words, an agency will call, will occasionally call and say, I mean, sometimes it's self-evident. If the mayor's office is appointing a new commissioner, it's 
fairly self-evident that that's something that needs to be done quickly. Um, but occasionally agencies will call and say, you know, we're hiring this and this, can this get done quicker? We're sending you 125 people possibly. Well, although, as I said, so let me be clear, we do not do a full, and I, I want to get it right the second time since I got it wrong the first time and I, I'm offering apologies. Okay. We do not do a full background check on city council staffers. We do this sort of limited review. Mr. Chair, could I correct two other little things? I Absolutely, have an extremely yeah. efficient staff who passed me two notes. Um, I wish I, those practices were replicated elsewhere in city uh, government. But. We, we, you know what, getting it right, it's the coin that we live with. I said that there were, a, in talking about the 2005 use of force report, I said that we reviewed 107 IAB files. We reviewed 104. And NYPD imposed no discipline. We reviewed 107. We re you want to answer this? Um, okay, we looked at 179. There, there's a full public report on this. We reviewed 179 of 107 where, of 104 where we believe discipline was required by our own independent review, 37 did not get discipline. Did, I, did you follow that? No, understood. Good. Did I get that right? Yeah. Wait, Nat, they, you did, hang on. I'm being told by my deputy commissioner I still got that wrong, and I really apologize. But I do admire the commitment to truth telling. Yes. Or alternately, May I send you a copy of this report? Absolutely. And you may read page 40. I commend you to page 47 of the report, which I assure you gets the numbers exactly right. Yes. Um, and then on the doc, the staff, the 20, 12 corrections officers, two civilian analysts, two captains, two assistant inspectors general, and two deputy inspectors general. Uh, Councilor Ayer, did you? Yeah, let okay. me just uh, just going back to the limited vetting. Uh, could you describe sure. the difference between what you would do if uh, you were background checking a commissioner versus limited vetting on an employee of this body? Sure. Um, Without giving any trade secrets that you may not. No, there's no to. trade secrets. Okay. We is there is a very detailed questionnaire that everybody that a commissioner has to fill out. It's actually, I believe, online someplace, isn't it? Yes, it's actually online on our website. It's it is a incredibly lengthy process that takes days and days just to fill out. Um, we then fingerprint people. We then go and make sure they paid their taxes. We run a bunch of checks on them. Um, we do interviews. For the city council, what I'm told, somebody will stop me if I've gotten this wrong, is that we simply check to see is there an open substan or sub previously substantiated DOI investigation about that person which is a very lim limited subset of the things we could check for. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, right. I got that right. Okay. This time. <laughs> I have a quick question about, since we're on the subject of Rikers Island, and mm -hmm. a quick question about ACS and DOCS, the implementation of the Raise the Age Law. There's a policy dimension, but, but my mm -hmm. question will be focused on the oversight dimension. Um, uh, so under the Ra Raise the Age Law, New York City must transfer all 16 and 17-year-olds from Rikers Island to what are known as specialized secure detention facilities. Mm -hmm. The city's planning to staff youth detention facilities with adult correction officers who, in my opinion, have, not in my opinion, I think, have been shown to be ill-equipped to handle younger offenders. And correctional mistreatment of, young, of youth detainees has been the subject, as you know, of a federal investigation and a court settlement. A number of advocates and elected officials have concerns that we run the risk of transferring the Rikers Island correctional culture of violence to these new facilities, and in doing so, in my opinion, defeating the very purpose of Raise the Age. Is there a role for DOI in overseeing the manner in which the city will implement the Raise the Age law? Obviously, you cannot prevent the city from staffing SSDs with correction officers, but do you have a role to play in ensuring that those officers are properly trained to handle 16 and 17 year olds? Um, we certainly do. We do in this regard. We have jurisdiction over, right now, the city has already has two facilities for um, juvenile offenders, Crossroads and Horizon. We have jurisdiction over those facilities. We have done investigations into those facilities. Um, we have issued, we issued recommendations. We have issued policy and procedure recommendations to ACS about those facilities. Um, as you know, we've actually um, made some arrests related to some of the non-secure detention facilities in the past. So we have jurisdiction in the same way that we do over the jails over this, and we've done investigations. 
Um, and as the, it, the population increases, we will attempt to shift resources to continue looking at that, although, as I said, one of the issues we confront is that a substantial chunk of our investigators are locked in by agency because of various MOUs. And indeed, we have in past budgets asked for more staffing for DOC, which would be helpful in looking at this. So there is absolutely a, there is a role. We will be looking at this. We will be investigating this. Um, as to the broader policy of whether it's a wise idea yeah, to have, that's. I'm certainly not. Right. I'm expressing my own opinion, but I, I just want you to know it's, right. it's a priority for me. Right. Um, certainly, if, if it were up to me, these facilities would be staffed with ACS workers, right? The city is going to staff them with correction officers in the short term, and then there's going to be a two-year transition mm -hmm. to ACS workers. What I would expect from DOI is to ensure that to the extent that there are correction officers in, the, in these facilities, that they are properly trained, mm -hmm. that they receive even more specialized training than ACS workers receive, and then and what efforts what progress is the city making toward completing the two-year transition? And can it be done much sooner? I don't know what's feasible, but, but I certainly hope that it can be done much sooner. So you should know that we will absolutely be looking at this issue. We will be looking at the training issue. We will be looking at what's going on. I do think we need to be careful. As I said, we have done investigations in these facilities, and it is not they, – they are not – as staffed by ACS workers now, they have not been problem free. Of course. So, uh, the mere changing over from doc to a, in, in some ways, just like the mere moving people from one facility to another isn't going to solve the problems, the mere changing over from doc employees to ACS employees in and of itself, I don't know is necessarily going to solve all of your concerns. But we will absolutely be reviewing this. It is a concern of ours as well, and we have had conversations. Although I with maybe about maybe if my facts are wrong, I suspect cases of brutality are not as prevalent among ACS workers as they are among correction officers. It, issues of brutality are not issues okay. of relationships and undue familiarity. However, can be okay. brutality is it, br we have not seen issues of brutality. That okay. is true but we have seen other issues. Which was the subject of the federal lawsuit Correct. dating back to 2015 or 14? So. 15, I, I believe. 15, yeah. Yes, issues of brutality are not things that we've seen at the facilities. Okay. Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, it's good to see you. Um, uh, two quick questions, because we're late in this hearing. And, uh, um, so one, um, following up on the uh, NYPD issue of sort of where discipline did not match either what was recommended by CCRB or what you guys thought. First, the numbers you're referring to are from the use of force report that you guys put out in October 2015. Yes. Which was primarily cases that were before 2014 or so, right? Mm -hmm. Most of those cases dated to the prior administration. Um, we are, as we do with everything, we are very much following up on that and hope to have other things to say about it. So that, I guess that's my question, which you've answered, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And, and of course, that was in the context specifically of the use of force. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think a lot of progress has been made at the NYPD in this administration. I have a lot of respect for Commissioner O'Neill. If there's one area where I really think we are um, still not where we need to be, especially it is in accountability where there are uh, incidents of misconduct. And obviously that was in the news very much just a month or two ago on an independent investigation, mm -hmm. um, which I think was more focused on things coming out of IAB than the CCRB. So I guess my question is in light both of the need to kind of come back to this issue in light of the fact that most of those were from the prior administration and this one and in light of the fact that there's some reason to be uh, concerned more broadly about, you know, whether, and again, this is in the context of a small percentage of officers giving a bad name to a much larger percentage mm -hmm. of officers. And to me, when that happens, the good work of the vast majority of officers is undermined, not only by the conduct of the very small percentage of officers who engage in misconduct, but by the fact that there's not accountability when they do. So 
it, it sounds like you implied that this is something you're looking at, but I guess I want to just ask it publicly. Uh, this seems to me to be an area that is really um, important for you guys to be focusing on. I agree with you. It is absolutely an area that it's important for us to be focused on. Um, we wrote the report in 2015. We then wrote a follow-up report that was issued, I guess, maybe two months ago, looking at them because one of the ref one of the reforms that came out of the 2015 report was the idea that the NYPD would now, for the first time, require every time force was used, not excessive force, force, a threat resistance investigation form called the TRI form would be filled out. And so it seemed to us the next most important thing to do is to see, after giving the NYPD some time to get this thing unveiled, were they doing so? And what we found was that in a number of ways, they were not consistently getting the forms filled out and they were not consistently reporting force. So force is still being underreported. That was in a report that we issued roughly two months ago. Um, the next, but the next step is to look at, now that we know that force is still not being fully reported and we need to make changes there, what is happening in the disciplinary process? That is something that absolutely needs to be looked at. It is something I will be very honest with you, will take some time for a variety of reasons. Um, these things take time, some of which, as I testified to this committee under the prior uh, chair, um, there have been issues with the NYPD's production of documents and information. Uh, they have slowed investigations, but they have not prevented them. Um, I assured this committee, and I will assure you again, that it, at such point that I believe that the failure to produce information um, cannot be resolved internally and is having a sufficiently negative effect on our ability to do investigations that it requires coming back to the council and correcting the testimony that I gave, I will do so, but we're not there. My testimony now stands. It has slowed investigations, it has not prevented them, and we are still trying to work through some of those issues. So I, I appreciate that, and I know this chair will want to will want you to follow up with him. Um, it makes me nervous that it's going to be a while. I have to be honest. I feel like this is a question that a lot of New Yorkers rightly have. Um, it could be resolved by one PP, um, obviously, without needing your oversight and investigation. The way the administration has handled 50A makes it much harder. Um, so I will leave it there. I feel like this is an area where your reports have been good. A lot of changes at the, at the NYPD have been good. But the fact that when there is documented use of force, in too many cases, the consequence is minimal, is less than the CCRB recommends, it, it just corrodes confidence. So we don't need to go back and forth uh, about it further. I'm glad you guys are looking at it. I want you to know it's something that I, at least, and I think other, other members of this body and the chair are eager for you right. to, be, and, to be looking And at. please understand, it is a very serious priority for us. It is the reason we wrote that report in 2015, so that we could say to the public, to this council, to everybody who needs to know, this is, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this failure to discipline in the last couple of months, and there have been a number of articles written about it. I'm not going to comment on any of the articles or what we are doing vis-a-vis -vis those specific situations. But this is something that we, uh, in, in our defense, we pointed out in October of 2015 and to be clear, the thing that I'm upset about is not that you have not done more oversight and investigation of the down, you know, of the mm -hmm. reductions in discipline. I, I'm, you know, so I, you know, I, I agree with you that there you provided some evidence. There's been other investigations that provide some evidence. Um, I'd like to see the problem get fixed more than more reports about it. But uh, but the tool we have here is to do oversight. So right. let me just ask one other uh, question, and I, it's possible that you've gone over this uh, since you've been here. This is about the restructuring, um, not on the NYPD IG side, but on the SCI and Department of Education side, because I have, you know, I've been reading the newspapers and heard from some folks uh, in SCI as well. But uh, there is one thing I just really want to make sure of and ask you on the record, because as, as I understood it and was looking at it, even under, um, as things have been, you know, until now, the number of, uh, of, in, of investigators, of staff at the SCI, relative to the total within, of I, you know, within DOI, 
um, is a much lower percentage than the percent that the Department of Education is of the New York City budget, which is to say, if anything, more resources n need to go just as a matter of proportion mm -hmm. into focusing on the Department of Education. <laughs> so I want to make sure, obviously at a minimum, since DOE funds uh, that work, that there's not any diminution of resources. But really what I think is merited, at least as I do the math, is an increase in resources to look at, at DOE because, again, the, the headcount has just been much smaller than the percent that DOE is of the budget. And I know, you know, obviously a concern people have raised is that as you have positions that go across a number of different of the squads, some resources could get essentially you know, diverted from DOE to being more broadly supporting the DOI. What I just want to know from you is that at a minimum, there's no diminution of resources to looking at DOE, and that if I'm right that the that the proportion, if anything, should be increased, that you'll look to do that over time. So there has been no diminution. Um, let me go back to first principles. The Inspector General for the school system whether we title it the Special Commissioner for Investigation or the Inspector General, technically it is titled Special Commissioner for Investigation. I tend to refer to it as the Inspector General because it is important to me that we have consistency of investigations, that we handle investigations involving the school system and the NYPD in the same way that we do everywhere else. And so that's the reason for the internal nomenclature. Um, that office has always reported to DOI. It is, it, always will, it is independent and always will be of the Department of Education. There's been no diminution in resources. The newspaper article noted there is a position that happens to be vacant there that we are using for a overall DOI function. That does happen from time to time because all of these IGs are dependent on, um, you know, on DOI as an overall functioning. I am actually hopeful that that's temporary and we've even said to OMB that we are doing this in a temporary way and we'd like the line back. Um, this is a very important area. I certainly would not say no to additional staff. Am I just, am I right as a matter of uh, math that the headcount as a percentage of total DOI headcount is, is substantially lower than the percentage that the DOE budget represents of the city's that budget. Is, I believe that's true. Somebody's going to sit here with a calculator and do the math for both of us, but I'm reasonably certain. What is the, the headcount, by the way? What is the number? Uh, for, yeah, for this one, I'll say it publicly. 67 budgeted, 57 um, actual. And the total DOI headcount? 700 and Oh, okay. 67 is the budgeted head, head count for SCI. Overall, DOI has a little over 700 people, so it's about 10%. I strongly suspect that the NYPD, that the, I'm sorry, the DOE is more than 10% of yeah, the city. Yeah, it's over 20. Percent of the head yeah. count. I, I do want to caution that there are lots of factors that go into decisions about how to allocate resources of which size is only one. There are agencies that are small but require more intensive review and agencies that are larger that require less. But there is no doubt that size is a factor. Um, there is no doubt that with more staff we could do more. I am hopeful in the next six months it, it is extremely time consuming to add staff, um, especially forensic accountants and auditors. Um, if you want a life tip for what you can study in college <laughs> to guarantee that you'll have a job when you get out of college, forensic accounting and auditing. Well, my son's a freshman. I'm going to call him right now and I, say I got I a have, good job for you. All, all jokes aside, I have <laughs> Nursing said, and also forensic accounting. We have had, I have had conversations with deans of various schools in New York, and including John Jay, and said, we will basically hire as many qualified forensic auditors and accountants as you can graduate. You know. We'll hire them as fast as you can graduate them. Um, right, the problem is my deputy commissioner pointed out, we don't pay as much as the private sector or even a lot of other places. Or hire as quickly. And therefore can't <laughs> hire as quickly. Uh, but I would like to add to the school's inspector general more a 
accountants and auditors because they spend a huge amount of money on contracting. And I would like DOI to be able to take a closer look at that contracting and where that money is going. And it is abs on my list of things to do over the next four to six years, that is on my four to six. Increasing that function is on my four to six year plan. That's good to hear. Thank you for that. I think we share the belief that that needs to, you know, is a, is a critical area of, of oversight where lots of stuff is happening that, that can't possibly get the level of oversight and attention it needs. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few more questions, and I'll hand it over to Councilmember Salamanca. Um, you spoke of the NYPD slowing down investigations. I'm not a lawyer, but that sounds like obstruction. <laughs> Obstruction as a legal matter is a very specific, precise thing, and if there was anything meeting the legal, precise definition of obstruction, we would take appropriate action. Um, and let me be clear, I am not suggesting that anything akin to the legal definition of obstruction is going on. Mm -hmm. I want to be very clear about that. Um, we have had issues, as I've testified before, with the pace at which the NYPD produces material and in some instances have had disagreements with them about the production of certain materials. While that has slowed some investigations, including um, one that we, I expect we'll have a lot more to say about in the coming days, it has not prevented any investigations, nor have we yet hit the point where I have felt that the our attempts to resolve this by working with the NYPD are, have hit a wall. I'll phrase it less provocatively then. Um, are these slowdown in the investigations in good faith or bad faith? Like is there just, you know, there's disagreement, bureaucratic inertia, or is there an intent to impede your ability to do your job? I can't answer that question because I cannot read minds. But you can infer from behavior. If you if you if you feel like you're in no position to answer that question, I. We are still. Let me put it to you this way: We are still discussing these issues both with the NYPD and with City Hall. We have not yet hit the point at which I believe it is necessary to come to this council, and say the issues are unresolvable. Um, if we hit the point at which I determine that the issues are unresolvable, I will be back to this council, but we are not there at this moment. Duly noted, is there any other agency that slows the production of documents? The way NYPD does? Yes. Not now. There has in the past, but not now. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask a, a few. I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask somebody who does this every day whether I overstated. She thinks I haven't. I, I want to ask a f just a few quick questions about um, construction safety. Sure. Uh, and then I want to head the mic to, hand the mic to uh, Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, as you know, we have a crisis of construction worker fatalities in New York City. Um, how many investigations has DOI conducted regarding construction safety? Um, that's it. It, part of that, and I don't want to do one of these what does is mean, part of that depends on how you define an investigation. Here's why. Every time there is a serious accident on a construction site, whether somebody dies or is seriously injured, at the same time that the NYPD and the fire department are alerted to this, DOI is also alerted to this, and staff from our construction squad go out there. So literally once or twice a week, we will get a note of, yeah, I think maybe once or twice a week, but certainly many, many times a month, we will get one of these alerts and we will send people out there. If that constitutes an investigation, there's a huge number of investigations. In the overwhelming number of those incidents, our folks come back from you know, the on-site investigation and inform me or inform the, associate, the IG and the associate commissioner who inform me as appropriate that there's nothing for us, meaning 
there's no evidence that the injuries were the result of somebody violating DOB regulations. And in which case, there's nothing for us to do. We are not, you know, the NYPD, we are not the fire department. In some small subset of those cases, we will then, they will say, it may be that there are violations of DOB regulations and we will do a more comprehensive investigation. In some, in most of those cases, the conclusion is that there's no criminal activity. Somebody violated DOB regulations, but not in a way that you could demonstrate was sufficiently linked to the injury to prosecute somebody. And in a small number of cases, our folks will come back and say, we think there is, and at which point we will sit with the district attorney and we will suggest to them that this person should be prosecuted. In most, although not all of those instances, the DA will then agree to do so. In some instances, the DA will say, we just don't think the evidence is enough to convince a jury and that it, that is absolutely, let me be clear, that's absolutely their right. Um, I believe in the last 18 months to two years, we've done three manslaughter cases, which is more than have been done in a long time. Uh, there are, although I don't discuss ongoing investigations, I will tell you there are several other investigations like that that are going on that I believe by the end of the year will result in additional prosecutions. Now, in addition to overseeing DOB's enforcement of, of the building code, mm -hmm. there's a sense in which you play an enforcement role in relation to contractors. You have the authority to arrest them if you find evidence of criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. Do we have stats on the arrest of contractors who are responsible for either, either injuries or fatalities on construction sites? I can get you. I don't. Okay. Other than the three manslaughter cases that I'm aware of, we can get you some more information on that. Okay. H how many? Uh, how large is the squad dedicated to construction safety? We. That's not a number that we generally put out. Okay. It is large. Um, certainly, with more staff, uh, there are other things that we could do to go back to my constant complaint about right. auditors and analysts. Um, additional auditors and analysts would allow us to do some larger proactive reviews, both of whether contractors are routinely violating DOB rules, also bluntly whether real estate owners are in violation of various DOB rules as relate to tenant harassment. Like Kushner companies? Or? Uh, without right. commenting specifically yeah. on that case, yeah. because as you know, we never comment on things that, Fair enough. that are ongoing. Um, we have, as you know, I believe the year before last, we actually did arrest a landlord um, for essentially filing false paperwork and creating hazardous conditions for tenants, and we arrested them for all of that. We certainly have jurisdiction to do that. I'm obviously not going to comment on any specific investigations. Uh, the city council enacted uh, landmark construction safety legislation, local law 196, mm -hmm. which requires extensive tr safety training and a site safety training card for every worker. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel, do you have the resources um, necessary for the enforcement of that law? We do some of that enforcement, and as you know, we've done both arrests and, and reports related to site safety cards, and there is no doubt that the that forged site safety cards are a real problem. There is no way that DOI, with our present staffing or anything like it, could <coughs> fully enforce that, a chunk of that enforcement will ha would have to reside with DOB. Um, we simply, at, at 700 staff overall, I don't think it's it's reasonable to assume that we could do the full enforcement right of that. Um, are you seeking an expansion in that area? Um, Somebody's checking on the yeah. exact new needs. The, it would be in our new needs request, which I believe you have, but I'll, if they give me an answer in the next minute, I will. If not, I will send you a letter with okay. an answer. Sorry not to have every detail no, at my I, fingertips. No, I, I think, and since we're, I'm going to ask one more. I don't have it with me right here, but I, I will ask about, I, I'm going to make a statement about Kushner companies. I know you cannot, but obviously we found more than, 80 falsified filings for building permits across 34 properties in the span of four years. Uh, there are these forms, these PW1 forms, mm -hmm. that will ask simple yes or no questions. Do you have occupy units that will remain occupied during construction? Does your building have 
rent regulated units and when it came to the second question in particular we have reason to believe that Kushner companies lied repeatedly so m my question is have you investigated um, the practice of falsifying PW1 forms um, have, have have you made arrest in relation to the falsification of PW1 forms what what has been DOI's work in this area sure about a year and a half ago, we arrested a landlord um, who had was essentially falsified a series of forms. I do not know off the top of my head whether it was a PW1 form or something else, but we will check on that, and I will get back to you in a written follow-up. Um, but certainly, it was about false filings that allowed the landlord to create un uninhabitable situations for tenants and intend to get the tenants out. So we have, we've done these cases, we have the jurisdiction, we ha did arrest that landlord. We certainly, where there is a wholesale um, failure to accurately report on these forms, have the right to do that. I want to caution that criminal cases are tricky in this regard because you need to demonstrate not only that the form is false, but that the person who signed the form knew it was false when he or she signed it. And one of the issues that comes up in a lot of these cases, not just this, but a number of the others, is that you have, unless the form explicitly <coughs> says, I personally have knowledge of everything I personally did. This is why we were able to do the asbestos cases. We arrested 17 asbestos inspectors for falsifying forms saying there was no asbestos on this construction site. Go ahead, feel free to knock down the walls, when in fact either there was asbestos or they'd never checked because the fo that form as written requires you to say, I personally was there and did this stuff. When the form doesn't have that, and I don't believe the PWI form does, but again, we'll check and get back to you, it's a much trickier case to do criminally because you need to prove that the person who signed it also knew, in other words, if one person knows that, you know, if one person in the company knows that you know, there are rent control tenants and another person in the company fills out the form and the two of them didn't talk, you may have a regulatory matter, but you probably don't have a criminal matter. Yeah. That's probably more detailed than you wanted. But. And one more problem with those forms is that it states that falsifying a PW1 is a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is under state law, falsifying a legal instrument could be a felony. It can be. And yes. And it seems to me it should say that on the form, that, that that's... Um, That's my I, policy opinion. I can't, well, if we, if we, and as I said, I don't even want, I, we do not even confirm whether investigations are ongoing, Fair so enough. I'm not going to, but if we were to do an investigation and were to find that the way the form is constructed is an impediment to doing criminal cases, then we would absolutely issue a report saying that. Absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner, um, Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Excuse my voice, I have, a, I have a cold. Um, Commissioner, I wanted to just ask you a, few, uh, a quick question about um, oversight and investigations on the Department of Design and Construction. Has your agency done any investigations or audits in terms of their projects in the last four years? I would like to get, I mean, certainly they are, they are within one of our squads and certainly we have done I don't believe there's a city agency that, that we haven't done some oversight of. I am not aware of any major investigations that have been completed in the last year involving DDC, but I'm speaking really slowly in the hopes that if I'm saying something really stupid, somebody in my staff is going to stop me. Um, but I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to get back to you on that one. All right. I just, you know... Um my, um, just wanted to express my frustration with the Department of Design and Construction. I'll give you an example. I have a project in my district. It's called the Roberto Clemente Plaza. Um, it's one of the largest DDC public space projects with a budget of about $13 million. They started construction in May of 2014, and today is March of 2018, and the plaza has not been completed. Uh, there has been issues with the contractor filing for bankruptcy, work not being done, and, you know, I've had housing developments built faster than a plaza, you know, in, in one of my busiest uh, hubs in my district. And I would really love uh, to see your agency, you know, pay more close attention to some of these projects 
that I agree some of, some of my colleagues are are facing frustration with DDC as well in terms of the delays of their projects. So with your permission, council member, what I'd like to do is have somebody from the squad that deals with DDC reach out to your staff to get the details of this particular incident, and we will take a look at it and get back to you. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, you've been, I'm, I'm just going to run through a few issues and then. I, I'm at your disposal. Um, some, some issues that have been on, obviously, in the papers. And uh, so do it franchise agreements. Uh, as you know, as you might know, Charter Communications, otherwise known as Spectrum, has been found by do it to be out of compliance with this franchise agreement. In addition to failing to comply with the franchise agreement, Charter's under investigation from the Attorney General for allegedly defrauding New Yorkers over internet speeds and performance. Does DOI have oversight over franchise agreements? I believe that we would to the extent that we are giving something of value to an agency, but I'd like permission to respond to that to you in writing after I can talk with my council staff. Fair enough, because I find do its enforcement of franchise agreements to be lackadaisical, and it seems to me um, you have the most institutional memory on investigations, and there's a, there should be a role for DOI in enforcing these franchise agreements. Um, but so there are, as far as you know, there's no inspector general. Who is there? An, which squad covers Do It? Um, Do It is in squad, is in squad four. Okay. Um, so we do have an inspector. Obviously, there is an inspector general. Squad four has Do It. Five? Yeah, I thought it was five. Okay. All right, it's five. I thought it was five. She told me four, but no, squad five. Yeah, um, five. Okay. We are, it is in squad five. Uh, and in fact, as you know, we issued about two and a half years ago a very, very detailed report on the 911 completion project that yeah. was done by them. Um, on the franchise agreement issue, let me talk with both squad five and council, my, my, my council, and give you a more fulsome answer. Understood. Um, a second issue. According to a New York Post article dating back to February 27, 2018, Two of New York's biggest insurance providers, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield and Emblem Health, have been accused of defrauding taxpayers in the tune of $1 billion. Um, are you aware of this matter? I am aware of the matter, okay. and I cannot comment at this time beyond telling you that I'm aware of the matter. Uh, does DOI have jurisdiction over the matter? Yes. Okay. Any updates? I, 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 I want to respect the confidentiality of investigations. Um, so I want to see how I can ask this question. Obviously, there's ongoing, continuing interest in the lead safety. Mm -hmm. are, are you in a position to confirm whether NYCHA is properly conducting lead safety inspections, properly conducting remediation and abatement, whether NYCHA is in compliance with federal, state, and local laws governing lead safety? I, I honestly cannot confirm that at this time. Okay. Another issue is administrative subpoenas. Uh, according to a New York Post article dating back to January 8th, 2018, the NYPD issued an administrative subpoena to Google for the purpose of obtaining the, quote, entire digital history of a 17-year-old high school student. Um, has, has DOI looked into the practice of improperly using administrative subpoenas in the place of what should be a court order or a judicial subpoena? Can't the, other than to tell you that I'm aware of that issue, I can't comment. You are aware it. of the issue. I'm okay. aware of the issue, and I can't comment further. Okay. Or we we are aware of the DOI writ large is aware of the issue. Um, this one obviously has been widely covered. Harvey Weinstein, the former film producer, obviously sexually harassed Amber Gutierrez here in New York City in 2015. The governor has recently ordered the attorney general to investigate the Manhattan District Attorney's handling of the case. The account of the NYPD's handling of the case all come from within the NYPD. Has there been an independent examination 
of the NYPD's handling of the Harvey Weinstein case? The issue of the NYPD's handling of sexual assault cases um, is one we are very much aware of issues relating to the NYPD's handling of sexual assault matters and beyond that I cannot today comment for And the reason I'm asking specifically about Harvey Weinstein is, you know, there is a perception that powerful people are above the law, that, that law enforcement institutions are much more aggressive in holding account everyday people than powerful filmmakers. So that's, that's and that's obviously a critique that's been leveled against the DA's office. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as I know, there's been no independent examination of the NYPD's handling of the Harvey Weinstein case. I understand there's confidentiality, but I just wanted to raise it as a cause. I, right. I, at this moment in time, I think it is a, it is a fair, questions about the NYPD's handling of sexual assault cases are fair questions, but I can't go beyond saying anything about that just yet. But you have the authority to investigate the NYPD's handling particularly of Harvey Weinstein's case. We do. I want to be careful about one thing here. Um, we do. As a general rule, I don't believe it is a good idea for the Department of Investigation to reinvestigate a specific case handled by the NYPD for a variety of reasons. One is a matter of resources, and two is absent some genuinely improper conduct but having said that, the broader way in which these kinds of cases are handled is something that we have an absolute obligation to look at um, and we'll have more to say about it. In the Although future. there is a difference between investigating the Harvey Weinstein case versus investigating the NYPD's handling of the case or the DA's handling of the case. Those are. Right, obviously. So that's not, a, I'm not requesting, I'm not talking about reinvestigation. It's it's overseeing right. best practices, I, whether. I, un I understand you. And then there are a number of issues about best practices. And I don't believe that they should be limited solely to the way that one particular case was handled. Okay. Do you, um, I don't mean, I don't want to, I, I understand the, obviously, the disinclination to look into individual cases, right? But could, could an exception be made, um, and now I'm speaking hypothetically, could an exception be made when there's concern that a public powerful figure might be, that there's a standard for, for the powerful and then there's a standard for everyone else? Could an exception be made for high profiled cases where there's concern that there might be preferential treatment from law it, enforcement? It could be, but I think that is the kind of decision that needs to be exercised remarkably judiciously. I think that's fair to say. Um, that is the extent of my question. Do you, Commissioner, you've been generous with your time, um, and I'm an admirer of your work. I'm an admirer of, of really the transformation of DOI into a much more robust oversight agency, and you can count, sorry, and you can count on on my committee to be as supportive as we can be. So. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you. With that said, this hearing. Now we are proceeding to public testimony. So we have Mr. Komatsu. Ms. O'Grady from Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center, and Ms. Augustine from Samaritans of New York Suicide Prevention. And can we have a two-minute time timer?
Good morning. Press good, the button. Good afternoon by good now. Good yes. afternoon. Yes, it was a long and fabulous hearing and uh, new topics for someone from a suicide uh, prevention center. Um, good afternoon. My name is Fiona O'Grady. I'm Director of Government Relations for Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center. Thank you, Chairman Torres and the committee for the chance to speak today. Um, as we see all too often these days, violent and self-harming behavior are on the rise, impacting our families, friends, and communities where we work and where we live. This problem touches people of every age, race, sexual identity, and culture, especially those living in poverty, the mentally ill, veterans, immigrants, and LGBT and Q adolescents. So it makes sense that Mayor de Blasio would make preventing suicide a priority. What does not make sense is that in this battle to help those most at risk, the mayor would eliminate funding for Samaritans, the only community-based agency in New York whose sole mission is to prevent suicide. Samaritans created New York City's first suicide prevention hotline 35 years ago, answering 1.3 million calls from those in, uh, in distress. And when the mayor determined New York needed to expand its suicide prevention network, one of the first things he did was to cut funding for Samaritan's Hotline. Samaritan started the city's first suicide prevention education program 30 years ago, providing 40,000 New York City DOE and community agency healthcare staff with needed crisis response training. And when the mayor's office issued contracts to provide that training to New York City schools, he again rejected Samaritans, who last year provided, um, we taught close to 800 psychologists, social workers, et cetera, from nearly 600 schools citywide. Same with volunteerism. The mayor promotes it, but cuts funding to a hotline that's staffed entirely by nearly 100 community volunteers who donate over $750,000 in free labor especially when the mayor states in Thrive that we'll work t with our partners to create new programs and make them um, work. We would like the opportunity to work with you to look into this. And on that note, I'd like to pass on um, the next comments to my colleague, Sambal Augustine, a member of Samaritan's executive leadership team. Sambal. Um, good afternoon. I want to uh, thank the committee for this time. My name is Sambal Augustine, and I first came to the Samaritans 15 years ago as a hotline volunteer. At the time, I was studying to go to medical school, uh, but my experience at Samaritans changed my life. People talk about wanting to make a difference in the world we live in. Samaritans volunteers actually do something about it. Um, the first lesson we learn on the hotline is to shut up because you can't be listening if you're doing all the talking. We learn about judge, uh, how judgmental we can be, how often we make assumptions, avoid topics that make us uncomfortable. Mostly we learn to respect the fact that people are unique and complex and there are no easy answers. It's humbling work because it forces you to realize when you're trying to help someone and it's not about you. Um, an important realization, if you are going to be effective talking to someone who's depressed and feeling like there's, there are, they're standing on the edge of a cliff. Samaritans has over 100 volunteers that reflect the city's rich diversity. They are caring, devoted. When they complete the intensive emotional boot camp training, they work one shift a week, once a month, and overnight from 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning. Samaritans volunteers do what it takes uh, to make a difference. They make the city more responsive to people when they are most vulnerable. Samaritans provide a necessary, necessary an alternative to other services and should be embraced by the mayor and the Department of Health. Why they do not is certainly a question. At the same time, Samaritans must, must thank this council uh, for without your ongoing support, our hotline would have closed years ago. And on behalf of Samaritans volunteers, I wanna thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tawaki Kumatsu. Um, we've met talked previously. Um, on January 8th, I tried testifying in opposition to your Right to Know Act bill in the Blue Room of City Hall. Uh, members of NYPD actually tried to pre prevent me from entering City Hall for that purpose. So there was some discussion earlier today in this meeting about NYPD issues oversight, also with regards to HRA. Um, I gave you some information to look at, in, look at it in your spare time. 
I'm currently defending a frivolous um, criminal prosecution of me in the Bronx. Um, about, I think 12 days after I testified on December 12th or December 14th in City Hall, I was illegally stopped, seized, um, arrested in retaliation for just walking to a drugstore in a public area. So if you're having this meeting today to, I guess, make an inquiry as to whether there's sufficient oversight of the NYPD, I talked to the commissioner on February 23rd at the New York Law School about this federal lawsuit against the mayor's head of security. He told me he's not gonna answer my questions and he claimed I filed a lawsuit against him. I haven't. So if I'm having these face-to-face -face conversations with the appropriate people, I'm not getting appropriate redress. When I tried going to your October 4th town hall meeting by Fordham uh, Law School, the NYPD kept me out of it. So if I'm a whistleblower, if I have a first amendment right to walk through the doors, conduct myself lawfully, and I brought it to your colleague's attention that this has been a repeated practice whereby when the mayor was up for re-election, using these public meetings as campaign events, and I can't walk through the doors, that's actually voter fraud and voter suppression if you think about it. So I guess at the end of the day, I don't, I don't mean to waste your time. I, the reason why I'm here is I live in housing for veterans by Crotona Park. The landlord did a bait and switch. They're using taxpayer money. Um, they're gonna have a fundraiser in May and they're not making repairs. They don't have the building registered with the HPD. I reported this to HRA and HPD. They're not doing a darn thing. So can you? I'll have my staff uh, get your information and then we can follow up with HPD. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Sir, Mr. Sullivan? Sorry? This, your name is Mr. No, What's he's the person who assaulted me okay. on July 2nd. Um, is it your testimony that you were stopped by the police from going to testify at a hearing at the Blue Room and then several days later at a CVS in the Bronx you were stopped by different police and it's, those two things are connected? Uh, they're not connected, it's just coincidental, but in total it's happened to me more than 20 times at public meetings. Um, there's corroborating witnesses, it's on video. I submitted FOIL requests to the NYPD. I have their own video confirming it. Okay. All right. If you want to copy the video, I'll no, 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 I'm good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Are we entering any testimony for the record? Or? Okay, great. So, with that said, this meeting is adjourned.